Jeff in. See you on the lift. Back attack, dude. <laughs> Fun boy on. Hey, your homies good. Slide down in big hills. You know what I mean? On a big, nice burgundy snowboard. All right. It is a monumental day here at the bomb hole, which is presented by Pub Beer and, of course, Run Through a Wall Smelling Salts. Now we got uh, Jeremy Jones guest hosting. Jeremy Jones, what's happening? Man, it's a great day. I'm happy to be in the booth today. Love to hear that. And, of course, we got our producer, Silk D. Silk D's kits looking fresh. Silk, how you doing today? Feeling good. Looking good. Yes, you are looking good. <laughs> Nobody's going to argue that. <laughs> and we got the man of the hour, Sean White, in the booth. Yo. What's mm. happening, Sean? Dude, thanks for having me. I'm hyped. Oh, we're so psyched you came down yeah, to so talk psyched. to us and should be exciting. And normally I do an introduction for our guests, mm-hmm. but I think you're the only guest that literally needs no fucking introduction. <laughs> so. So I want to hit the is. I want to hit the ground running let's with some it. snowboard nerd stuff, right? So oh, yeah. cool. let's talk Skyhook Cork Front oh, Five yeah. Stalefish. Now I'm curious, what age do you think you're going to be able to do that? Till do you think as long as you can walk, you'll be able to do that trick? Oh, mm. for sure, for sure. <laughs> well, I'm getting inspiration over here from <laughs> Jeremy. <laughs> That's I, good. He's still up and running. I could do it. Skeleton still going. I can't I wait it. to see as these snowboarders age, like world's oldest McTwist. That's what I'm looking yeah. forward to. Oldest McTwist, oldest Crip. You know, it's heavy as I start, like, if you check out Tony Hawk's stuff, like, as he's gotten older, he's kind of done heavier stuff, like street skating without pads. And, you know, it's just interesting to see. And I'm using him as my marker of, like, oh, if he can right. do that, I could probably mm-hmm. sky hook yeah. it. <laughs> 50 Actually, the oldest McTwist. <laughs> was a question that was going around for a while on here and he was left out for that. Yeah. I think mm. there's without question he's in that. Yep. Oh yeah. I'm not looking for first, I'm looking for oldest now. That's what I'm looking yeah, for. Just the oldest McTwist. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That'll be amazing. Okay, well let's get into it cuz you've had an absolute hell of a run. You- Three Olympic golds, won everything. You've had undefeated seasons, mm-hmm. ten SBs, X Games gold, and, and you know skateboarding and every everything you could win, you could, you've done it. <laughs> now, how's filling the void without competing right now? Man, it's weird. Uh, I will admit that, like, you know, when you do something and it's got like this purpose, there, there's this end goal. Like, I'm going to work on this trick so that I can be here at this time and I could do that trick to hopefully do well in this event that will qualify me for the. You know, there's like a path. And now when I go ride, there's not really that agenda anymore. And I didn't realize, I think, how much of that was like something I really enjoyed because it's a stressful thing to compete and to be ready and to be under pressure. But I did find like fulfillment and enjoyment out of that. So now when I'm riding, like there's no real agenda, but I am finding my way through it. Like just, just, you know sleeping in and going when it's good. And like, you know what I mean? Like I was watching one of the dudes who were qualifiers was just dumping snow. And I was like, good choice. Good choice. <laughs> you know, like, is it stressful just enjoying, though? you know, that's the thing. Like it always looks like it's not stressful because mm-hmm. you're so good and you're so at that level. I mm-hmm. think that's, I think that is common, a common perception. Like, nah, dude, what, what are they talking about? Like he's got it every time. Mm. Well, that's like, yeah, I mean, that, that's what I would say in my head and what the media would say and these things. And then to kind of live up to that at times, I remember feeling like, well, what are my options? Like I I can either like use this to motivate me or I can just like let it destroy me in a way. Cause if there, there's that kind of pressure constantly on you, you're like, okay, well, if everybody believes I can do it, maybe I can. You know what I mean? Rather than the like, oh my God, what if I, what if I fail? What if I do this? And, and you kind of push any of those doubts out of your mind. Um, but that was, you know, solely contest driven. There was like a whole nother world to my snowboarding that was just like enjoying the mountain with friends and mm-hmm. hanging out and trying dumb tricks that I had no business putting into my run or anything like that, you know? So, um, so I'm just kind of like back to that, just like trying random tricks. Like I, 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 retired and I got this crazy itch to go hit jumps. Oh my mm. God. I really wanted to enter the natural selection. Did you, no, I was mm. dying to. And, um, I, cause I went and kind of like did some press around it and like got on the microphone and stuff one season, uh, at Jackson hole. And I hadn't really ridden there during like an insane powder day. 
and it just dumped. It was just, I was like, why am I not riding in this? <laughs> and so I made a mental note, like, I got to go back. I got to do that. We got to get you a Natty Select. Oh, I was man. so fun. Yeah. Yeah. Would, and actually talking to Travis uh, yesterday, he said, ask him if he wants to do natural selection. No way. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I me mean, yesterday. it just looked like the most fun thing imaginable watching everybody go down and and it had that sort of kind of playfulness to it like no one's expecting me to crush the backcountry so you know maybe i being the underdog for a bit would be fun you know you need to do no that. expectation Dude. and and we make a ripping powder board so it's like oh this would be perfect you know mm. um so yeah and then and then just jumps in general i mean i i stopped competing in slope style after sochi because it was just too much to bounce back and forth from one discipline to the other and which was so annoying because they they invented the airbag that goes all the way down the jump after that i was like dude i just dro i dropped at least 10 front triples to my back and just <laughs> just destroying myself um and then the season after i'm like i'm just not going to do it anymore and then they invent the bag i'm like really guys um, but, um, but yeah, I've, I've had this weird motivation to do, you know, obviously things outside of half pipe. Yeah, absolutely. Where's your rotations at right now? Pretty good. Really? I feel pretty great about things. I, I don't think, I mean, a lot of my decision to, I think, retire, uh, a, a lot of it, some of it was physical, you know, like recovering and things. And, but a lot of it was like the mental drain, you know, of, of being certain places and wishing I was somewhere else or, or kind of the, the long haul of being away from friends and family and things. And you're just like, gosh, I've done this for so long. Like, I know I want to put my head down and get through it and, and, you know, achieve this thing that I've set out, set out to do. But at times you're just like, ugh, like it's just weighing on me. Mm -hmm. And the same things aren't as exciting anymore after you do them multiple times over and you're battling with this internal sort of like, I'm telling myself I want to do this, but my heart's kind of not there at times. And how do I keep, you know, in it? And, and so I feel like a lot of my physical was still there, but the mental was like slowly going. And then, and then the physical, dude, I, I was, <laughs> I was so thrilled about the season after the Olympics. I was like, I'm going to do some crazy stuff. I was so thrilled. And I was at Sauce Bay, um, riding with the, with the people up there, you know, everybody. And I threw like the tripod butter. It's like end of the day. I'm like, I'll oh, just do like a stupid butter for JJ. He was follow cammy me. And I'm like, I hit like a little chunk of snow and the board slipped out and my arm kind of went above my head and my shoulder popped out of socket. Shoot. I was like, oh my God, like, it's never happened to me before. And I'm sliding down and I like push my shoulder back into place. I was like, okay, I could finish the session. And then I later found out, you know, I tore my entire labrum and really put a damper on the rest of the season. So this coming season, I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm really up. fired up. And I've got to peel this like incredible sweater because I'm cooking. Yeah, <laughs> yoink that thing off. Sorry, bud. <laughs> I know, like, I like that. <laughs> so that's Hold interesting to hear also that you're into jumping right now too because I think back to vintage Sean White and I think back to you doing slope style contests and I remember, I have a vivid memory of like the Vail session I went uh, when I was a kid and mm. and watching you, there was like the battle for all four nines, right? Yeah. You, you, were you the first person to do all four nines in a run? I was. Yeah. And that was a big deal. And it was so fun. Like it, let's, th that would be so fun to see you just getting back on the, on the wedges. Oh yeah. One of the sickest events I think ever, mm -hmm. I, it was so much fun right at Vail. They would have pyrotechnics. It was done at night. There'd be a big fireball at the last jump and they built kind of like how old school Aaron style had the like, um, sort of like rail wall feature that you would like go up, hit the thing and come back down. Like they had that sort of ending thing with the fire. Like it was just such a cool competition. And I just remember like loving that event and I'd, I'd show up every time trying my best. But the funny thing that happened was I was actually, <clears throat> I was on the chairlift and my biggest competition was Andreas Wig, Vig, Wig. Um, and uh, I remember him doing basically three nines in his run and I only had two. And so that day I was like, if I just kind of like lean into it and get over the fear, maybe I could learn them today. I learned both that day. It was a switchback nine. And I want to say back nine that day and did it that night at the comp to win. So I really, really kind of phoned it in, but it, it worked and it's a jam format. So like the pressure wasn't, 
so intense of like, here you got two runs and that's it. And I remember kind of nailing it out the gate mm-hmm. and they're like, well, he won. And then it was just like this like random session for the rest of the, the night. And I ended up doing, I had ne- I was like, well, what if I'd go one more? And so I ended up doing, I want to say, I want to say switch back nine, back nine. No, I'm sorry. I forget which order it was, but I ended with a front 12. So I did the three nines and the 12 at the bottom just because I was like, oh, I'm feeling it. <laughs> you know, but, wow. it's like a, but it was like those kind of things. And that's, that's why I love talking about competition because it like I, a normal day, I would never have done that. But I was like, I felt like my feet were to the fire. I wanted to win. I wanted to have a great performance because I won the year before. And like, that's what competition would like do to me. Mm-hmm. I'm like, oh, I got to do this. You know, it would like elevate my riding. I was talking to Gabe LaRue and he mentioned that there was years where you showed up at the Dew Tour and everybody else had been in Sauce and doing their early season program training and you took a board out of the plastic and in practice, that was your first time riding for the year and you went on to <laughs> dominate the contest. There were, I mean, I don't, I don't recall that specific thing. I knew at times I would take breaks from riding just because... I felt like my time away from the sport was just as important as my time on. So I, I felt like, you know, the career, I mean, it started when I was like five and then, you know, sponsored at seven or so, pro at 13. I mean, to keep it exciting, you have to take time away. And I never really lived in the mountains. So I always kind of had other things going on in my life. So I would kind of get back to those things. And once you come back to the sport, you're just fired up. It's not like I've been... I've been here kind of grinding it out in this cold winter through Sasfe or through New Zealand to Sasfe to what, like I was fresh. So just like the board out of the package, I was like ready to go instead of kind of being bogged down by whatever. And then I was pretty confident in my ability to do the runs I needed to do. You know what I mean? Like the muscle memory, some tricks harder than others, you know, like the double McTwist at times would just like elude me. It would just like go away. And I'd have to kind of like figure it out again, but other tricks were just the kind of staple. I just, I knew I could do it every time. And with the two run format, you got all these people kind of vying to make their run. And if they don't do it, then the pressure's, you know, staggering on them. The sponsors are there, the cameras are on, the media, all this stuff. And, and most riders would kind of buckle under that kind of pressure. And so I felt like a lot of times I would just kind of play the odds. I'd be like, oh man, I'd be sitting there at the top and I'd be like, oh, everybody kind of fell. What is their mindset like? What are they dealing with right now? And then I'd kind of calculate what I wanted to do for my run. And I was kind of, I wouldn't even put in the best run. I'd put in something pretty great and get hopefully the top spot or close to. And then I had room to build where they're trying to just get a run in. And so I don't know, I, I, I don't want to, I'm trying to humanize it, <laughs> you know, like it's I, mental warfare. I, I wasn't, I wasn't, you know, a, a machine, but I definitely like was calculated at that kind of stuff. You know, when I show up and I'm like, Oh, he's been working on this trick, but I've watched practice and he's made it one out of maybe five tries. And this person's doing that. And they think I'm probably going to do this trick. So they think they have to, you know, if I do the double 12, it's over. So they got to probably do, you know what I mean? You're just kind of calculating what people are going to do. And then I would kind of base my run off that or by watching at the top or I'd have like Bud or JJ be like, what, what happened? <laughs> like, tell me what happened. <laughs> I like yeah. the chess yeah. moves. Yeah. It's yeah. insane. I want to, I mean, supporting Gr- uh, Gabe's comment mm. firsthand. I've seen you go from skateboard winning vert contests mm. to coming to your snowboard mm. like we shared a sponsor for quite some years went on some tours together and i i saw that right next to me and that you know to gabe's point that's what's insane mm. that you can show up you've done so much work in your head you haven't left this thing alone like mm. you said the time away is important but dude skating straight to snowboarding mm-hmm. the muscles are panicking that's insane. <laughs> yeah. It's, and winning both. <laughs> yeah. Good point about the muscles panic. Yeah. It is a different muscle group, I would say for sure. The landings aren't nearly as harsh in skating. I mean, when you crash, you crash. I guess it's the same, um, the crashes. But like, I, I guess touching on that, I mean, for me, 
I always felt like going from skate to snow was an easy transition. I don't know why. Mm-hmm. It's because, you know, you're going from this thing that's like technical and there's precision. It's like I'm flipping, the board's flipping. If my foot's out of place just slightly, the board goes flying away and my run's over. So I felt like that gave my snowboarding like some insane sort of precision the ability to be consistent because you had to be so consistent to skateboard and actually Mm. make those runs. Snowboarding was probably what we're down to like five, six hits in the half pipe. The vert runs, 16 walls. So, and you're not going downhill, you're pumping to get your momentum for every single hit. So it was just a different beast and it was like twice as hard, twice, you know, uh, way more walls. And so I had to kind of like, then I would, well, I should say, I, I, I would go from that to snowboarding where I'm like, oh my God. What easy. could be easier? The board's going to stay on my feet. Dude. Like, how would I not <laughs> land? Seriously. Like, what are you talking about? So, <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like <laughs> you're using chopsticks and then you're using a giant shovel. Like, it just yeah. felt like, oh, this just got so much easier. Yeah. Um, but the one thing I would say my snowboarding gave my skateboarding was the scale. Skateboarding, the the, the half pipes were maybe like 14. I should, the vert ramps, I say 14, 13 foot for ramps. They started getting a little bigger with the 20 foot rollins and stuff, but it was pretty small compared, you know, the biggest air would be maybe a 10 foot air where you're trying to go like 20 plus in the half pipe. So by the time I bumped down to skateboard, I'm like, Oh my God, this is like a mini ramp. Like what's happening. You know what I mean? Like I, I, not to knock the mega ramp at all or anything, but like, I remember when that came out, I was like, Oh, that's cool. You know what I mean? We hit these huge, you get it, you guys get it. You know, you hit these giant jumps all the time on the mountain with the giant step down drop. Like it's I, massive with wind and like, you know what I mean? So I don't get it. I've yeah. never once tried to go 20 plus out of a half pipe. Oh ever. yeah. <laughs> so there, there is a cool correlation though. But, you notice with, yeah. with uh, like uh, also like you move, for example, and yourself, when I watch you guys ride, you guys land at the top of the transition mm-hmm. every time. And then you also generate so much speed down the wall and mm-hmm. you guys hold your edge. You know, you watch a lot of the other half pipe competitors or any civilian. Yeah. We're fucking throwing <laughs> speed checks all oh, over yeah. the place, you know? And it's just like, there, there's definitely something interesting watching your guys' technique, how it's mm. so precise, like you mentioned. Well, I feel Tacked like in. he's a skater as well. I mean, he yep. skated mm-hmm. at the Olympics. Um, you know, I would say landing high on the wall is kind of like a skateboard thing, I would say. You know, skating mini ramps and doing all these, you know, you're kind of landing just below the coping. And I don't know whether that's just like a mental carryover, but every time I would go snowboarding, it was all about like landing high on that transition to get the speed for the next wall. Um, and then, uh, sorry, you're just, pumping down too, though. You pump down and up. Well, that was what was funny. You mentioned the line and stuff. I mean, that came into calculation as well. I was just kind of looking at everybody riding. I was like, okay, well, they're doing about three turns before they get to the half pipe, and then they're kind of rolling in the edge of the wall here and they're doing their first hit. And I was like, okay, well, if I just go straight, I'm going to have a lot more speed. I'll probably go bigger. You know what I mean? I I know it's just these blatant sort of things. I was like, okay, if I just go straight, I'll just, I'll go bigger maybe. And then, and then I realized from, you know, just pumping in general, like if you've ever jumped into a border cross or anything like that, like those guys pre jump before the rollers come so they can catch and get the speed so I kind of took some of that and like created my own drop in. So instead of like rolling in the edge or the side of the, you know, where the, the pipe kind of rolls up and before the deck, I would kind of get to the knuckle and then jump and then pump from there. So I had like a lot more momentum going into like it. Like a free five foot air. Y- yeah. It just kind of like, okay, well here, I'm already starting off a hit and now I'm pumping through. And then, yeah, of course you got to set your edge and do all those things. But, um, you know, that drop in quickly became videotaped. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> I was like, damn it, they got my drop in. Um, no to me, cut, it's like forever a, to catch you still. So, yeah, 100%. I, I think about it's almost like a William Wallace Braveheart vibe because it's like, <laughs> hold, you know, they're hold, hold, <laughs> hold, and you're just hauling ass. And you're not fucking speed check. And yeah. it's like, you, you, I mean, I like how you keep it really simple. It's just like, I'll go bigger if I don't speed check. But, you know, I think for most civilians, they're like, don't yeah. speed check, don't speed check, don't speed check. Dude, ah, it's, <laughs> it's a know? nervous thing. It's yeah. not some, it's like, yeah, I wish there was like a special sauce I could tell you about, but it, it was blatantly like, well, I just can't speed check. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? You got to mentally kind of check yourself doing that. Like I used to do runs where 
I wouldn't grab, I wouldn't do anything. I'd just try to see how high I could go. Just purely focusing on airs because I'd be like, okay. And then adding in the grabs and the spins and stuff later because you start getting used to going that fast and that high and setting those lines rather than focusing on like, I got to spin now and I got to get the grab, miss the grab. What about the next wall? Like purely focusing on one thing at a time and then like putting it all together mm -hmm. later. Um, you know, and so like, for the half pipe, it was one of those things where if you, if you can't fix that mental sort of thing, like I love, we'll probably talk about him a bit, but like Louis Vita, I love him to death. He's, he's had like a bit of a nervous tick where he will throw a check. Mm -hmm. I think he's going way bigger now, which is awesome. He just is. saw some footage from him at sauce crushing it. But for a while that was something he had to, I think he's getting over it, but he had to, he had to like get rid of that. It's just something you do. It's like, a, I don't I'm, I don't really golf, but I've heard, that, you know, you can get these little habits you pick, <clears throat> excuse me, pick up and they just, you know, can kind of ruin your game because you can't shake them. Mm -hmm. And now you're going in mentally thinking like, God, I hope I don't do that. You know, you mm -hmm. have to break that sort of muscle memory. Dude, I'm checking for ticks like crazy <laughs> at the end of every pipe run. I'm, I have like 20. Yeah, 100%. <laughs> Dude, tick city. <laughs> and the other thing too to think about too, especially when I think when the back-to-back -back 1080s first hit yeah. and you know you were dominating and at a, at a certain point in time, some people could No, do, I was getting smoked. Well, when that first, when they, for those first when they came first in. came yeah. out, I, I, would yeah. got, I got destroyed. Yeah, I hurt my knee at X Games. I was on my path. You know, I finally, I got double silver at yep. 15, bumped up to double gold. I was like, I did it. I hit the, this is Valhalla. Like, I'm, I'm here. I made it, you know. Mm -hmm. And then next season's going all to plan. And I, you know, I, I, I tore my meniscus during pipe uh, practice for finals. I'd already won the slope. I was like, oh, perfect. Double gold again. Here we go. Let's cement in this sort of legacy or something. And, and I blew my knee out and then I came back and the sport had made these leaps and bounds and I didn't even podium at the next X Games. So I was pretty crushed. Well, but yeah, not to... Well, yeah, no, <laughs> totally, sorry to be uh, yeah, chronologically yeah, yeah, yeah. out of order, but when, when, what I, my point I was getting at is the, the fact that sometimes people were doing similar tricks in, in the pipe when it gets down to the, the techni technical tricks. Yeah. But if you're the only person in the pipe that can go 25 feet out, mm. well, that's the hardest trick because you're the only one that can do it. That's, that's very, that's something that Bud Keen would always say. <laughs> that's where I got that from. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah, that's so funny. I heard that. I was like, wow. I was like, Bud. Because he'd be like, he'd be like, but no doubt. Like, you you know, if, if you're the only one that can do it, then that's, that's pretty impressive and pretty tough. And that should be scored really well. So for a while, I would start my run, which is like the biggest backside air I could. Mm -hmm. um, and I love how that's kind of coming you know, it kind of comes back throughout time, you know, obviously at the last Olympics, massive hit by Hirano's and, yeah. you know, it's just so sick to see. I mean, I think um, it's a standard now. Like yeah. if you, if you have a huge backside air in the pipe, use it because it's mm -hmm. scored. It seems to be scored as well as anything. Yeah. Well, it's impressive and it's hard to hold on doing that. I mean, I, I know a lot of people that used to hit jumps and they're like, I can't air straight. I have to do a spin. Otherwise mm. I will get thrown off access. Cause I remember people hitting jumps doing sevens as like the first jump. And I'm like, what are you doing, dude? <laughs> They're like, this is the, this is my straighter. This is the way I feel the most comfortable, but like, it's hard to go that high and that fast and, and to just kind of hold steady in the air and just, you know, kind of accomplish that and come down in a, a really kind of manner in which you're ready for the rest of your run. Absolutely. Now I think that's a good segue to talk. I noticed early, Sean, the stance and the setup was different, and then the stance bumped out. Mm. And Bud said 25 and a quarter with an inch and a half setback is your setup? I don't really fully know. I know <laughs> I know it got wider, though, and I remember being like, huh. And I, I kind of blame JJ a bit, which is so funny because he, he – I don't blame him, but he was like, dude, I – I don't really know your stance. I just eyeball it. I'm <laughs> like, really, dude? You don't know my... Because <laughs> he'd come through and like put the board together. But um, um, yeah, it got wider for a minute there. I've kind of like started to bring it back in. It was just one of those things where it got wide. And then I was like, I don't know, it just felt okay. And I was winning. So I was like, well, don't change anything. You know what I mean? But yeah, I've gotten... Uh, I've heard a lot of Sean, <laughs> Sean wide 
comments. <laughs> well, Dude, it's so wide. <laughs> yeah. So Very so wide. why so so is it cuz I mean, Bud, I this is Bud's words not yours, yeah. but he was like, I mean, he fucking stomps. I'm pretty bow-legged though. Naturally. So naturally, yeah. My when I was when I was a kid, I had um I had to sleep. There's like a bar on, for my legs to keep them straight. Not, not, I don't know if it was like Forrest Gump, but like I had these, these like metal things I needed to wear to kind of mm-hmm. correct the bow leggedness. And then I went in for a doctor's visit and my dad came into the, the you know, hospital room or whatever. And they're like, Oh, he's fine. <laughs> Cause they just took one look at my dad and like, Oh yeah, it's just me. <laughs> they're just bow legged dudes, I guess. Um, but for me, yeah, the stance just kind of got a little wider, but I think I just kind of land really centered. And so it, it really helped me kind of just stay stable. Um, but I've recently just kind of started bumping it in a little because I, 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 to be completely honest, I don't really know. Like it wasn't a mental decision to like make it wide. Hmm. It just kind of went there. I was like, oh, it's working. And the throw, you have no problem like throwing off of that width. It um, never felt like a struggle or harder, easier, narrower. It didn't Seems until maybe narrower. the last season. And maybe I was kind of like in my own head about it. Cause I'm watching, you know, the Japanese riders just flip and spin so fast. And they're on these tiny snowboards with these very narrow stance. I was like, Oh, maybe I'm missing the boat here. Maybe I'm like still rocking this style. And that's just not, you know, optimizing the newer tricks or whatever. So I, I, I did slowly start to like bring the stance back in. I, I don't think it was like a, a decision I made that like, Oh, this is what I'm about. I didn't even really notice until people started to tell me. Mm, you just you, threw it on. Yeah. I would just go, you know what I mean? And, and that's kind of been a, a funny thing in my career is like, I mentioned the secret sauce. Of like there's very simple explanations for a lot of these things. A lot of it's <laughs> so like sick. he had it so together and he was so ca- like, no dude, we were winging it a lot of the time. You yeah. know what I mean? Like, you know, yeah. I feel like it supported your mental game. That's where a lot of this lands. It seems like just your processing, mm. your strategies that you mm. create, um, where you find the motivation and the power kind of in the drive to keep going. And, yeah. And like nailing the first run, maybe not even your best run, but it's mm. a, it drills them. Stance is the same thing. They're so worried about your wide stance. And mm. in the meantime, you're, you're, you're cracking 25 <laughs> foot backside airs and yeah. double Mickey's. And yeah. it's just like, oh, well, there's the score. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's the thing though. It's like, it's like, if it's not broken, don't try to fix it. And mm. I was such a creature of habit. Like I remember riding a really terrible board Burton came to me and they're like, you got to change the board. That's like our hundred dollar snowboard. We got to get you on something better. <laughs> you know I, mean? I was like, it's, it works. I'm good. Like I don't, I wasn't so particular at the time. I, I've changed a bit, you know, o- over, over the years, but you know, I just like would kind of approach the sport in a certain way where I just like, I love to do it. I love to get tips from people on how to do certain tricks. And like, I would say my sort of like happiest place was Mount Hood. Cause you're in a situation where all the pros are there at your disposal in a way, if you're, if you're, if you're bullish enough, just go talk to them. But Hey man, how do I do that? Make twist or Hey, how do I, how are you doing that? You know, and, and just get these little tips and things from the pros and then kind of implement it into my own writing. Um, and then you got these kind of like soft landings. It was just the best. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? You could kind of fully, that was before the airbags and foam pits. That was kind of like the best alternative was to chuck in the slush at hood, you know? Um, yeah. So going back just real quick, I think talking about uh, board setup, it would mm-hmm. be fun to get into, you know, do you, did you ride like when you were in the midst heaviest of your competition, like special non-production boards? Did you get them stiffer? I know a lot of half pipe guys like really stiff boards. Mm. The only time I rode, and I, I liked this about Burton and it's something that I've carried through in, in my brand. Um, but it, the board I was riding was what you would buy at the store, which was pretty sick. I mm-hmm. thought I'm mm-hmm. like, how, where else can you go get somebody's race car that they're driving on the track? Like where else can you get, maybe you can buy someone's tennis racket or their shoes they run in or something like that. And, and it's a cool connection there. That's what I ride at a certain point though, <clears throat> you know, the stiffness of the board and certain things weren't really for the masses. You know what I mean? It was like a particular thing for me. And, you know, I'm pretty, I'm pretty 
like you said, you, you said, <laughs> you said, I stomp, like I land really hard sometimes and I would just be snapping bindings left and right, breaking boards. Um, you know, I'd way rather break the board than my hip. So I just push the tail in the wall or so, you know what I mean? I would just kind of get out of the, you know, whatever situation I got myself into. But, um, the only time I really wrote a board that was very specialized was for the Olympics because, and the only thing that changed was the base materials because they would, they would back me up and we would get these really special, you know, flown in from Austria, like these, these bases that would hold the wax like way better than the normal boards. <clears throat> so when I go through my kind of like quiver of boards, I can always tell which ones were from the Olympics because they weren't the die cuts. Mm. They were different. The species. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. All right. It's time to talk sun bum. They make some of the best sunscreen on the market. And let me tell you something. Sun care is year round, not just the summer. You can get cooked up there on the hill. The sun reflects off the snow basically like you're in a big tanning bed up there. So be sure to wear sunscreen when you're snowboarding. I always choose the mineral stick. It's SPF 50. I keep it in my pocket. It's just a little bit bigger than a piece of chapstick, you know, so you can ride with it in your pocket and not even notice it and make sure you don't get roasted up there. They got a killer team and they support snowboarding. You know, they got Jed Anderson. They got Steffi Luxton, Parker Zoom, Blake Paul. Jill Perkins, Brian Fox, just an all-star cast of snowboarders. They also make sun care, skin care, hair care, lip care, and even stuff for babies and kids. I got the shampoo. Let me tell you something. I might not be a good person to advertise the shampoo, but have you ever seen Blake Paul's hair? It glistens beautifully. So if you want to support a company that supports snowboarding, be sure to support Sunbum at your local snowboard or surf shop, or you can also find their products at sunbum.com and use promo code THEBOMBHOLE for 15% off. Okay, we're going to take a quick break and do some general house cleaning for bombhole stuff. Now, I first want to say thank you so much to all of our Patreon members. We couldn't do this show without you, and we appreciate your support. Now, another way to show support for the bombhole, if you do not want to become a Patreon member, is buying some merch. So this holiday, we got the Run Through a Wall Holiday Pack. So we got the brick, it's the three pack of smelling salts. You get 30 salts total, comes in some nice clean packaging. We look like a real legitimate brand. We also have a new autumn run through a wall beanie with the brick pattern on it. It is a hitter. You're gonna wanna get these before they're gone. It also comes with some run through a wall stickers. So if you wanna get that, it's a perfect gift for the holidays, little stocking stuffer, if you will. We also got another autumn beanie that just dropped. It's called the Repeater. It's really clean. It's gonna sell out quick. And then of course, we got our token Mud Dogs hoodie. We had a t-shirt, it sold really well, so we just made it into a hoodie. So all that stuff's available now at bombhole.com. And we appreciate you guys for listening. Well, going back to young Sean, thinking about... Let's go back. What it was like. Let's go <laughs> Let's back go in back. time. Yeah. Back. You're 10, 13 years old. You're hanging out with, you know, Keir and Trevor Andrews and Dude. and they're boozing and people are playing cards and mm -hmm. you're freaking winning cars at Japan X and you're hanging mm -hmm. out with these older icons. I yeah. mean, just how was that? It was, it was awesome. I mean, it was like one of the best times of my life, but it was also one of the most kind of challenging because again, I'm 13 and these guys are in their like, you know, mid to upper twenties and we don't see eye to eye with anything. You know what I mean? I can't like, I remember just sitting there like trying to explain Pokemon to them and they're like, dude, I don't get it. <laughs> get out of here. I mean, you remember the bus tours and stuff. Yeah. Like it was, it was just a different world, but man, it was so fun. I remember like, I just wanted to be part of the crew. So they were all playing quarters one night and it was like Ross Powers, Kier, everybody. And they're like, we'll, we'll just give him milk. And I sat there losing at this game, just drinking so much. I drank us out of milk that night. I drank so much milk and they're like, well, what else? And, but I didn't want to leave and they didn't, they felt bad kicking me out. They're like, we'll just give him orange juice. 
I didn't realize I didn't know what curdling was. <laughs> so, <laughs> dude, I'm like, whoa. My mom's like, what happened? I was like, wow, I was playing quarters with the guys. And the first option was to give me Red Bull because they all had tons of Red Bull. And they're like, no, oh, we can't do that. It'll, it'll fly off the planet. But yeah, so I ended up <laughs> just like puking everywhere. Um, but it was a blast. I remember like going to Japan with, with the crew and, and, um, you know, just seeing people partying and going nuts. And it was just a lawless time back there then, excuse me. It was just, it was just like so fun to be around. And it was this world that I could kind of see, but I wasn't really a part of, you know, I was there with my mom working on my like math homework, you know what I mean? But I would kind of come down to the lobby. I was like, Oh, he looks tired, mom. What's going on? Like, yeah. He's just really tired. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Silk, we got a, a Patreon question. From BJ Emery, why don't you hit that one? Yeah, uh, this question is from BJ Emery. Mm -hmm. What was it like winning the Arctic Challenge at a young age? Mm. What was your "I'm not a kid anymore" moment? I mean, that was that was probably one of them um, for sure. I mean, dude, it was the Arctic Challenge. I flew across the world. I'm in like Arctic Circle, and Terry was, you know, my hero. He was the guy. I mean, everybody looked up to him and. He brought me out there to be a part of this event. And um, I think I ended up winning when I was 15. That was the first time I actually won competitions. I was kind of second place, you know, uh, yeah, 15. I got two silvers at X Games. I was getting second everywhere. I almost wanted a third to just get the pity. He was robbed. <laughs> you know what I mean? I was like, just give me. And so that at that event was the first one that I actually won. And, um, you know, it was heavy. Terry was there. And, you know, his recognition in Norway is like, pretty unparalleled. And so the next time I went to Norway or, or what was getting sent, like I was in the newspapers. I was all of, you know, to be a little kid and to see a 15 year old and be like, dude, I'm on the front cover of the Norwegian, whatever. <laughs> like it was just so bizarre to me to think that people that far across the planet could know my name. Um, but it was, it was a really big deal for me. I remember just kind of like being in awe of it. They sent me home with this incredible trophy and, and, um, and yeah, that I would say that one, and then the the event that I won in Japan, the Big Air that I show in the documentary, um, those were my big wins of that year. And that really, I would say, those moments where I actually, you know, went pro at thirteen was considered a kid. They're like, oh, he's future boy. He's gonna maybe one day, if he doesn't blow it, <laughs> like, because <laughs> there's so many things can get in the way, injuries and just partying and all these stuff, and so. Um, that was that moment of like, wow, maybe I'm doing this. Like, I think I made it. And I don't know, I don't, I don't know if there was like a huge prize purse for the, the Norwegian, uh, event Arctic challenge, but, um, Japan was like $50,000 in a car. And I remember being like, oh my God, what do we do? What do we do? This is, this is before they like searched your bags. My mom put that money in the cargo pockets of my snowboard pants and checked the bag. <laughs> It was insane, just like winging it so hard. Like, oh, what do we do? Like, what do you do? Your suburban family. And this, like, we kind of dreamt of this, but now all of a sudden it's real and it's happening. And, and, um, and it was crazy. And if you've watched the documentary, that was kind of like a bittersweet sort of moment for me. Like I said, when I was a kid, I was trying to fit in so much. I wanted to be a part of the crew and then kind of like got to this event in Japan and was just like, God, I feel like I've like been busting it. And, you know, worked really hard. I've just learned cab nine was like the thing to do at the time. I just learned it at mammoth and I was like, no one knew I could do it. And they're like, let's split the money. I was like, no, nah, we should, <laughs> we should compete, you know, cause people were pretty hung over and no one liked the jump. And I mean, think as a competitor and the things I've just told you, you know, you just told me you don't like the jump you just told me you don't want to be here and mm -hmm. I'm liking the jump and I've got a secret weapon, which is, is this trick. And I've been getting second place this entire time. I'm like, this is my chance. I was like, wow, this could be, this could be incredible for me. And obviously I was running the math that like, you know, it didn't like what it cost to get us out there and the hotels for the fam and all the stuff. It like, you know what I mean? Just what the money wasn't really that great of a situation once, once everybody got paid out. And I was just like, man, this is my moment. And <laughs> like I ended up winning. Mm -hmm. So, but it, it kind of alienated me from the group at that time. So, and, and it's not like I don't just like, okay, cool. See you later. Like they're all at the next stop. You know what I mean? So it definitely put me in a weird position. Japan was that big moment. And, and yeah, that was the kind of like, okay, I'm here kind of thing. 
I think it's dope. It's a, I mean, it's spearheading this really professional movement in competitive snowboarding. I mean, that's how you, you, you were professionally, are professionally the best competitive snowboarder mm-hmm. that exists. I mean, because it's mental, it's physical, it's all of those things. And there's, a, there's some costs to that, clearly, mm-hmm. it seems. But, dude, I mean, that was ahead of its time. That's mm-hmm. what people are trying to connect to just now. Yeah, well, I mean, at the time, it wasn't very cool. It was very weird to get to the bottom of the pipe mm-hmm. and not say, I'm just having a good time. It's sunny out. I'm just hyped to be riding with my boys. Can't, you know, th- that was the sound bite, and everybody kind of said the same thing. I think they were just more nervous of like, I don't want to talk in camera. I don't know what to say. I'll just hit the sound bite, you know, but I was kind of the first to be like, dude, I really want to win. I'm frustrated. I had this big trick. I blew it. Like, <laughs> I'm going to go back up and try try again, you know, and I'm just a really competitive guy when I'm in a competitive situation, but other times I'm, I'm, I'm not, which is so funny. And I, I, I tried to show that in the documentary. It is a very kind of sports focused talk. So I, I did focus on a lot of like the Olympics and things. And when I say I, there were directors or people kind of weighing in to help me get the project done. But, you know, a lot of things I feel like, and it's so fun to chat with you about it, but I feel like a lot of things were kind of taken out of const- context, you know, with the media and whatnot, because I was never, like I was calculated and I had like great strategy on the mountain, but I wasn't like, I don't think I was, you know, like a Tom Brady type where I don't know his routine specifically, but he's like, this is what I eat. This is how I train. This is how, you know, it was very laxed, you know, but once I was put into a situation where I had to be competitive, like, man, what else? Like, why would I, you know, like. You read the board. Yeah. I would just be like, okay, cool. We're playing, we're playing ping pong. Okay. This guy's got a pretty terrible Mm -hmm. backhand. This guy's got, he can't spin the ball. So if I spin the ball, he's going to, you know what I mean? And you just start doing that. And, you know, I did really well for myself in competition and then through doing really well, it kind of separated me. And then the, and then the, the, these dominating stories come out where it's like, he's unbeatable. He's this, he's that. And it, and it kind of put me, you know, in this pedestal in this place. And then, you know, I always felt like I would enter competitions and it didn't really matter that I won the last 12 or 20. I'm like, we're here today and I can't just sit here and go, Oh, well, shit, it's cool. I'll just like, I'll just like, you know, <laughs> phone this one in. Cause like I won the last six. So like, whatever, you know, I'm no, I'm here. Like let's throw down. I'm going to go for it. You know what I mean? And, and it was fun. It was so fun to, push myself and watch someone from the chairlift and like new learn a new trick that day so that I could win, you know, like, like it was just such an intoxicating thing to, you know, do well. And then through that success, like came a lot, you know, it came the recognition and it came the, you know, the financial side of things and the sponsorships and all that stuff. Um, and from a kid that was like to driving around in a van with his family, was pretty awesome, you know, like, mm-hmm. like, you know, that's, that's what I always kind of laugh about when I hear certain things in the media and other snowboarders and things. I'm like, dude, I'm, I'm very much cut from the same cloth, you know, and I, and I always feel like people kind of forget that from time to time. At least I feel like it, I don't know, maybe, maybe not, but you know, like, dude, we grinded it out. My dad, I was never even a camper at Wendell's you know, we couldn't afford it. My, my dad would dig the half pipe with the diggers so that I could, I could ride the pipe. I was always a day camper and we camped out at the parking lot just below Timberline Lodge. And I would brush my teeth at the lodge, um, you know, and, and my family, like, you know, that's, that's why I, I laugh so much when people, he's just not a grassroots rider. <laughs> I was like, what? <laughs> like, okay. Like, I just never knew what that meant, you know? And, and so, um, you know, my family, like, you know, snowboarding was our world, you know, and, and I don't, I don't know if it is as much today because my path really took me in a different place. I mean, when it snows, my dad calls me cause he's going to mammoth to ride. He'll ride with the fam. He'll ride solo. He'll, he's up there. My mom, same thing. Like they love the sport. I love the sport. And we kind of came on this journey. And then once you kind of hit enough podiums and do enough deals and do these things, like people kind of lose you know, the understanding and, and kind of 
sort of um, picture of where this all began. You know what I mean? And, and, you know, what would you do in the same situation? You know what I mean? So, so Sean, do you mind if I kind of jump in there on this one? And Please. It, so yeah. I think, I think there's a multitude of things going on here where you have in a certain situation, when you start to become the best at anything, mm-hmm. you have a fucking target on your back. Right. Mm-hmm. And, and it's polarizing in some senses because as pop culture in America or anywhere, we love dominant winners, whether it's Serena, whether it's Tom Brady, whether it's Michael Jordan, and your name is in that hat. So from a, from a mainstream culture, obviously do- dominating competition is beloved. Mm-hmm. However, in our quote unquote core snowboard community mm-hmm. that we are all deeply embedded in, you know, what we, and I'm, cognizant of so i'm i i'm just gonna say a lot of snowboarders Mm -hmm. do is they like their snowboarders to be a certain way Mm -hmm. they like their snowboarders to be core they like their snowboarders to know all the videos Mm -hmm. go to all the premieres be at all the events they like their snowboarders to to be in the fucking furnace smoking weed sometimes you know yeah. what i mean like, yeah they, i get you you know what i mean so i think that 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 is a factor that played against you mm. because people are simply put from a from a human nature standpoint yeah. they're projecting the way they want you to be mm. and that was a problem for people it seemed like mm-hmm. and did you felt that it sounds like no it's 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 such a great thing to hear you say that cuz you know when i look at my career and i look back, you know, I think I loved snowboarding on the purest of levels. And it's not that I didn't watch snowboard films and didn't, you know what I mean? Dude, they were on all the time. My brother was always watching all the standard films, all the Mac dog films. I was in most of them at that point. Cause I was super young, became friends with Rich Van Every and, and, um, and, uh, McIntyre, uh, Mike, you know? And so Let's throw those, yes, some air horns. Mm-hmm. Yeah, dude, give it up. Legends. Um, and so, you know, for me, like I always loved the sport on the purest level. Like I loved doing it, you know what I mean? And, and at the time, my sort of like knowledge of the sport or me going to the premieres, like, dude, I did. I went to all those premieres as a kid. I remember dressing up and seeing Sean Palmer and all these dudes come through. And, you know, my favorite snowboarders were, I think it was um, Damian Sanders. He had fangs and black mohawk throwing backflips and shit. Like, I just remember being like, this is it. This is the scene. And I, I loved it. Um, and I think as I got older, I kind of got pushed into this silo of, oh, he's this guy. He's, he's focused, serious sports guy. Um, which I would say kind of behind the scenes wasn't really the case. Like I was definitely out partying and having fun and like getting in trouble. And I think the thing that you'd have to realize though, is when something goes down, it's not that, you know, how do I describe it? Maybe, maybe it makes more sense. Like when I was a kid, I stopped doing some bad things because, um, I'd always get blamed. They're like, I know the redhead was there for sure. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? So like when, when you go out partying and whatever, the next day, the story was like, dude, Sean White came through the bar, broke a bottle, did this. And, and I'm like, dude, none of that happened. I went to bed. What are you talking? Like I was competing the next day. Like, yeah, I came out, I had a few drinks with some friends. I went back, but then the story was that like, I did these things. I was like, Oh my God, that's horrible. And, and I have sponsors, I have things. And like, dude, you don't want the, trust me, snowboarding is the world to me. Why would I want to threaten this ecosystem of like being able to snowboard as a living? Are you kidding me? Like it's the, the greatest gift ever. And so things like that would happen. And then I kind of like isolate myself a little more and be like a little bit more pulled back because like you said, I don't necessarily think there's a target on me, but there definitely was more talk. And so when you're out doing things and stuff happens, these snow snow towns are like these little snow globes, like word spreads that this happened or that happened. And so I had to kind of like protect myself in a way. And then a a lot of kind of crazy things happened over the years. Um, you know, that kind of isolated me, you know, when you're, when you're winning a lot, it's tough. Like, dude, I, 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 I don't know any other sports that would assume that, you know, after the Celtics and the Lakers play that they're all going to go get a beer together after, Mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Or that like, 
Kobe's working on his free throws. Let's go get somebody from a opposing team to come work on free, free throws with him. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean? Like there's Thank this you, yeah. sort of weird th- thing that the bro code of snowboarding said that that was supposed to happen. Mm-hmm. And I was like, God, it's so weird that I just felt like I was taking crazy pills. Like, why would they think that, that this is a normal thing? And, and by the way, like I, I put myself in their shoes. So I was like, gosh, if I was showing up at an event and not performing the way I'd want to, and I told myself this was the year and I didn't get my goal and, and, um, I'd be pissed. You know, I'm a competitor. I'd be so frustrated. I don't want to go hang out with this guy. <laughs> you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So it became quite isolating. So, so, you know, being the name walking around a snowboard town, like you, you got to imagine I had huge red hair. I couldn't go anywhere. Couldn't do anything without people talking. You know what I mean? So it was definitely like a weird, wor- weird world that I, I started living in, you know? And then as the winning went on, I felt like, you know, just, just the kind of craziness ensued. God, I don't know. I don't know how deep I want to get in there. <clears throat> it's hard to talk about because I'm, dude, I'm a person, you know? And so for me, it was like really hurtful at the time when certain things would happen. And, you know, my family at times wouldn't be on the road with me. So I had people around me that were like considered buddies and family and whatnot. And like, you know, like crazy stuff would happen. Like I'd be out partying. And, uh, you know, somebody took a picture within my very tight group and then later tried to sell that photo to TMZ, which would then damage my career. I'm like, oh my God. Mm -hmm. And then on the other side of things, I've got the industry saying he's not core because he's not going to hang with these guys and he's not coming to the premiere and he's not doing, you know what I mean? I'm like, God, why would I want to be a part of this thing that's, you know, kind of doing that stuff to me, you know, it's kind of like high school type stuff. You know, I would tell somebody something, they would go tell, you know what I mean? It was just like, oh my God, I trusted you and I can't trust too many people, but here I am, you know, and I, and I trusted you and you kind of betrayed my trust. And so why would I standard human stuff, you know, nothing to do with the sport. And so then that kind of like was what irked me, you know, and, and I got to say, like, it's become like, what feels like a popular sort of soundbite to say, like he's undeniably a champion, but you know, he doesn't really represent the sport. And I always thought that was so bizarre to me. And I got to say, you know, it was pretty disheartening to hear that come from Donna recently. I listened to the, you know, her podcast on the way down. I was like, wow, that's so heartbreaking, you know? Um, Because like what part of me doesn't absolutely love and, breathe and die for the sport and bleed for it, you know, and show up to all the events and do all the stuff, you know what I mean? And, and so I always felt like a funny disconnect and it was such a weird thing to hear that come from her. Cause I was like, Oh, like, you know, you know, she, she mentioned me using my platform to sell things. And I was like, wow, that's so wild. Cause you are from a company that used me to sell things. You know what I mean? So I was just like, we, we worked with each other, you know? And, I love Donna. I love Jake. And, and I, I still love Donna. I would never, you know what I mean? Say anything about that family. And I feel, you know, tense talking about it. Cause I, I do truly love them so much, but like to hear that was very hard to hear. I was like, Oh wow. Like, you know, what is it? Was it the deals? Was it the, you know what I mean? Cause when I look back on my career and I go, God, like, the amount of stuff that I turned down was staggering, you know, like seven figure Mm -hmm. deals for cologne, like these crazy things that like, I was like, I can't do that. I can't put myself or my sport in that place of like, look at where this is gone. You know what I mean? Like my biggest deal was Burton. Uh, Then it was Red Bull and Oakley. I mean, these are pretty endemic brands. I mean, I'd say the one that was the most outside the box would be target. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? But at the time, you know, I was working with my brother. He was designing all the products. It's like, what a cool thing. My brother and I can work together as a fam and design this line and like make money together and have this thing. Of course I'm going to do that. You know what I mean? And then kind of to turn around and hear that I'm not core, I'm not this or that. And then I see the same people that are saying that I'm not core come out in a Tostitos pizza roll commercial where they pop out of bed and go, sup bro. 
it's pizza time. Like, and I'm like, damn, like, I don't know. Maybe, maybe that is the sport. And I just kind of missed it. But I always felt like, you know, we are a sport, you know, and we're and sure there is the stereotypical thing from, you know, to be stoners from when, when, uh, you know, I forget his name, who the, the Canadian downhill, um, racer got busted for weed at the Ger- Olympics. Gerbaldi or whatever. Yeah, you know what I mean? It just we just lived up to the hype. And I remember seeing that I'm like, damn, well that's not the legacy I want to live in. Mm. So what did I do after the Olympics? I'm like, dude, I said no to so many things. They're like, can you just like slide onto stage? You know, and Letterman's gonna come over, he's gonna take his beanie off, we're gonna blast you with snow and then this, and then you say, Yeah, bro, and pop a mountain dew. And I, I'm like, oh my God, no, like absolutely not. I had to like be so calculated about the way I was representing not only myself, but like my sport. That's what you would think all the other riders were doing. So like, I don't know. I, I was in a really tough position, if you can imagine. Um, you know, there's my life and what I'm into at the time. Um, and then there's like kind of the needs of the sport and then to be the outward face of the sport for so long, I mean... I like to think I did a pretty good job, but I'm, I'm a, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm human. <laughs> like I made mistakes. Like I've, I've done, you know, dumb things, made dumb decisions and things, you know, well, like anyone, you know, I, I can't have that perfect slate, but I think through and through, I've always cared about the sport and loved the sport and embraced the sport to my core. I mean, y- you know, I know what, what is it? Louis told me, you talk cheddar bis- biscuits? Cheddar biscuits. Cheddar biscuits. Yeah, talk about cheddar biscuits. Talk about the amount of money I've lost backing this sport, dumping it into an event to make it the most epic thing for the riders, put it on the grand stage, Aaron style, at the, in the heart of Los Angeles, mm-hmm. blow it out, let's go, Kendrick Lamar on stage. Like, dude, the, the effort and time put into that thing and like we're on our way to break even and then COVID just... <laughs> You know what I mean? Like there's been so many things where like I've leaned into the sport and wanted to do more and be more. And again, juggling my own career competing is, is, is one thing I, I, we can touch on it now later in the, in the interview. But like now that I have more time on my hands, I'm, I'm really digging into those sort of aspects of the sport that I truly love, you know, focusing on the youth and the, and the, and the experience they have and, and, you know, there's just so much I can do now. And, and there's kind of like a, a sort of, uh, the guard's been let down by people cause I'm no longer the guy trying to win. I'm just the guy, you know, supporting and, and, and using my sort of I don't know, name or notoriety to push things through. But man, there's, there's been a lot that I've leaned into the sport that I don't think ever gets really taken to, into account at times, you know? Um, yeah, it's interesting. The give back is, insane it's massive it's as it's as big as your your accolades and all the things that you've accomplished in snowboarding in my opinion um Mm. i think it's a tired excuse anymore to point at you and and even say that as a reason to not be down that's my personal opinion but Mm. you know it's impressive um the give back um the money spent to be there, the money turned away. Like, Mm. dude, seven figures is some cheddar bisque for (laughs) some cologne. Like, who's not going to do that, dude? You know, in this day and age, Tell me where, send me the doc you signed right now. (laughs) Straight up. Send me the doc you signed. (laughs) Yeah, really pass it over the (laughs) table. Let's pop more of these, right? (laughs) Yeah, like, it it, it makes the world turn, you know? Like, this this is an amazing thing you do, Mm -hmm. but you need support to do it. And you got your own life and aspirations. Like, everybody's, we're just trying to, like, live through this human experience and, and do well. And, man, I didn't know whether this career was going to last or like crumble. I had aspirations to do what I did. And I'm so like, dude, thankful that it happened through perseverance and like the hard work. But man, I'm watching guys get like, just you know, destroyed, they're injured, gone, name just gone, people mm-hmm. not getting re-signed, people just disappearing. I was like, how long is this going to last? People talk about global warming. There's all these crazy things. The seasons have shifted. It's like, how long will this last? And can I kind of hang my hat that I took care of myself in the process? And, and I think, 
you know, so I, I don't know. It's always interesting to hear about the deals and the money and the stuff because it was just kind of like a byproduct of winning. And, and like Burton and I had an amazing relationship. I was like their champion and they put mm -hmm. me in every single ad and built a line around me and built boards around me and built you know, kids stuff, women's stuff. I mean, it was, it was a thing and we had an amazing relationship and she supported me in so many ways. So, so yeah, that's why I was a little shook when I walked in this morning. Well, <laughs> you, you know, I think this is, but I love you, Donna, and I get it. Yeah. It was they, well they, put. They, that was well, well done. A hundred percent. And I think that to get in there and just recognize the fact that it's really incredible to have the opportunity because I think you're misunderstood by snowboarding in a lot of ways mm -hmm. and you're clearing up a lot of this stuff. Mm. And I think it's really, it's really, um, it's really exciting to listen to and provide context of coming from somebody with the opportunities that you have and the space that you have. Mm. And we're on the, on a little bit of a different, we're in a different arena down here. So I think yeah. to provide context, like talking to JJ, he's like, Dude, you got to realize like he could go, you know, Brady's people are hitting him up for deals and he could, he could make money doing any type of things that he wants to do. Mm. So you have all these opportunities to make money yeah. and you're like, Oh, I'm going to start a snowboard company. I'm going to do a snowboard event. Like yeah. if you're, if you're, if you got dollar signs in your eyes, it ain't, it ain't in that, you know what yeah. I mean? <laughs> and it's just, mm -hmm. and it's, and it's like, I get it. Like, like, yeah, we like our snowboarders to, you know, party and do these things and whatever and, and, and whatnot. But then I kept looking around at like those guys doing that. And I remember vividly seeing as a child watching Roman, Roman DeMarkey be like, I can't do this anymore. Mm -hmm. I'm expected to party at every city I go to. And if I don't, people hate me for it. They're like, what, you're not going to do a shot with me? you're not going to smoke this with me. You're not going to, you know what I mean? You're the guy, you're the party guy. I thought, you know, like the expectation to do that and then still have this like insane career on the side. And you know what I mean? You just kind of had to pick and choose at a certain point. And I just remember like, <sighs> like <sighs> if you go back, like look at it, it was nuts. Like we just started doing double flips in the pipe. And Danny Davis beat me at the mammoth qualifying event. The last thing in the world I thought was going to happen. I was like, I'm a sure thing. I've been busting it. I invented these new tricks. Dude beat me. And he went out and partied and he fell off an ATV and he broke his pelvis. And he was in the hospital watching me win that Olympics. Dude, it's heartbreaking. Mm -hmm. Heartbreaking. I shed a tear with that guy when he made the team. The next season, I was like, dude, we missed you. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry that happened to you. There's decisions in life that you make. And it's like, man, I'm sure if you asked him if, 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 if it was worth it to go out that night and not do like hands down, one of the corest of the core snowboarders that we love to celebrate. I love that guy. He's amazing. But there are limits to this thing and there's decisions in life and you got to live with those and it's a bummer and no one from that core industry is going to like embrace him while he's, you know what I mean? It's while he's in the hospital room doing like, I'm sure he's got his buds, but dude, it's, it's, it's a hard pill to swallow. So, you know, when you really look at a career and look at my life and my decisions, I mean, they were all for pretty good reason. And you know what? It's nothing more core than a fucking 25 foot backside air. <laughs> Straight up. <laughs> Let's yeah. be honest. Dude. <laughs> Thanks, man. <laughs> and there's yeah. nothing more core than turning down deals. Like truly. Yeah, I dude. mean, I put a note, you're a protector of the sport and I, mm. I quote sport because that's a debatable thing, but this community and this that, culture, man. like saying no to those things, like how snowboarding was represented to the masses. Mm hmm you were the one that had control of that, mm. whether you, you asked for it or not and whether snowboarding recognizes it or not. Mm. That was you, dude. And saying no to those things is kept things at pace. Mm -hmm. It kept our growth and our, our community at pace, in my opinion, when I hear you talk. So yeah, thanks, thank you. Man. But I kind of get it though. Like, I don't know. It's fun to like, I always, I heard this, this analogy. It's like, <laughs> go to a movie 
the movie starts out and the main character's like doing great. Life's good. Mm -hmm. He's just doing it. Middle of the movie. Guy's great. Still good. Movie ends with the guy being great and it's still good. You won't want to watch that movie. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? There needs to be a conflict. There needs to be a villain. There needs to be these things and to make it exciting. And at times I, I, took on the role as the guy in the sport that wasn't very much liked. And then I, and then I like remember losing at the Sochi Olympics and it humanized me and people were like, Oh damn, it's kind of one of our guys. And he's just like his biggest moment and he blew it. I know what that feels like. That sucks. Mm. You know what I mean? And, and people loved me again. You know what I mean? So it's just this weird ebb and flow of things, but like through and through, it's just, it's just kind of how the media and people spin things. And you just kind of like, you don't look at the comments. You just push forward and you do your thing. I mean, this is exactly your your uh, key to success here. You you, <laughs> you just do what you do and and know that the people that do support you support you and and find the enjoyment out of life and, and, and whatever it is. And you know, man, if I dig snowboarding for these reasons, and that's why I dig it. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm I'm sorry if it doesn't match up with certain things that you find in the sport, but I don't hate you for that. I I appreciate you for that, and I dig that you do the sport in general. Cause that's why we're all here. Like it's fun and it's snowboarding and it's, it's been portrayed in my life as a serious, serious thing. And at times it was cause I didn't want the, I didn't want the journey to end, you know, but, mm-hmm. but yeah, through and through, it's been a blast. It's been so much fun. Dude. Except the injury in New Zealand. That sucked. <laughs> that was like a damn, <laughs> but everything else solid killer. Yeah. And, and also on, on behalf of snowboarding too, I do want to say, you know, fucking snowboarding loves you, dude. You may have had a bad taste in your mouth and you've got some bad, you know, everybody wants to bring down things that shine, you know, mm. every it's crabs in a bucket, but like snowboarding fucking loves you, dude. And, uh, and the fact that you're coming and talking to us and we're talking about fucking sky hooks and stances <laughs> and 1080. And it's like, yeah. that's what it's all. That's what we, we love to see it. And we're so appreciative of everything you've done. And oh, totally. the fact that you're coming down and, and, and getting in the mix is just, it means the world. So, um, it's been, it's been a fun banter journey. Yeah. So. Right on, man. And, and, and just to add to that, man, like, yeah, no, no bad blood for me, man. I, I'm, I'm here. <laughs> like that's, that's, that's been my yeah, thing always. And, it. And even after retirement, like I'm so fired up about certain things and dude, starting the company white space has been so rewarding, man. I'm like, we're able to raise money for charities. We've been doing all sorts of cool stuff, making products that are like, I think, you know, top of the line and like going to help that next generation. And I just think it's so much fun. And it's, it's kept me in the sport in a way where I don't have to be the guy with the target on the back and I don't have to be the face of the sport as much. You got these other amazing talented people coming through and, and I'm here to support them now. And it's such a fun thing. Um, you know, and I, I wish I could tell you about, there's a couple of things we're waiting for these, these deals to close, but stay tuned. Cause I, I've got some really fun stuff that I'm going to do within the industry. That's going to be so cool. And I just want to bring that, like that fun and excitement back to, you know, competition and, and, and the experience of snowboarding, um, on the purest level, you know. All right. We're going to talk about one of our favorite brands and that's Bub's Naturals. Now, Jeremy Jones broke both his legs in an avalanche and he swears by the collagen. It really helps with joints. It helps with skin. It helps with nails. Uh, it helps with recovery from exercise. So we've, we've talked a lot about the Bub's Naturals collagen it's trusted. It's great. But they have some new products we want to talk to you about. They got the Hydrate or Die electrolyte packs. They got 2,000 milligrams of electrolytes. They're vegan. There's no added sugar. Most of these electrolyte drinks have tons of sugar. Uh, gluten-free. There's no artificial flavors or colors or preservatives. It's hydration packs that are good for you. And I drink them regularly. I love the, the lemon lime. That's the one I put in the water on a regular basis helps keep me hydrated, and 10% of all of their profits go to charity. They have an incredible story from the founder and the origin. So if you want to support a great company that gives back to snowboarding, be sure to support Bub's Naturals. They also have their Bub's Brew Coffee, and you can use promo code BOMBHOLE to save 20% off at bubsnaturals.com. 
All right, we're going to take a quick break and talk to you guys about Dragon, the Dragon Alliance. They make some killer goggles with a killer team. They got Danny Davis with his signature collection. He's got a clean-looking collection. They got Gigi Ruff, Brian Noguchi, Leanne Pelosi. They got Kimmy Fasani, Brock Crouch on there. I see Blake Paul running the goggles. I see Big Air Jair running them. Spencer Schubert. So uh, killer team doing cool stuff in snowboarding. And if you're looking to pick up some new goggles, they are celebrating their 30th anniversary. They just released a new goggle called the NFX Mag. It's packed with next level features like proprietary Luma Lens color optimizing lens technology and Swift Lock Magnetics lens changing system. Everybody loves the magnetic lenses, easy to switch out. They got armored venting, OTG compatibility, infrared radiation lens options, and everybody loves bonus lenses. They got bonus lenses. So check out the NFX Mag. Like in all styles, it provides riders with high-end technology at a price you need. So head on over to dragonalliance.com, and if you use promo code BOMBHOLE20, you will save 20% off your total purchase, valid through December 31st with the exception of their Black Friday and holiday site-wide sale. Again, that's dragonalliance.com. Use promo code BOMBHOLE20. For twenty percent off, yeah, well, we got some pre-recorded guest questions we want to run through. Uh, but before I preface this one, um, this is a question from the guest who's going to ask, and he wants to know what snowboarder from New Jersey beat you a lot in your early days of your career. Oh my goodness, that's that's the easy, Danny Cass. Okay, Danny Cass yeah. uh, also has a. He said also to follow that up <laughs> once. Sean got seven pubic hairs. I never beat him again. <laughs> so uh, this is a question from oh, Danny. Wow. And uh, <laughs> here we go. Sorry, Sean. This question is coming all the way from Europe. And I just really wanted to know. It's been a while since we talked a couple of months. But is your number still? <laughs> blank. Blank. No, not anymore. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. There was some, I forget, I think it started with Ryan Sheck. No, Danny Cass started it, and he put my phone number in Snowboarder Magazine or something, <laughs> Trans World. And, oh, I could I could figure out where the, the, the mag had hit shelves across the East, because I started getting calls. It was like Jersey, then down to Boston, and then, and then I'm getting calls from here, and then all of a sudden the West Coast starts hitting me up, and... Oh my God! Yeah, no, don't put my number on. That. <laughs> Amazing that he wanted to bring that up. Wow, that was great. All right, we got yeah. another guest question from Gabe Larue. Here yes. we go. Hey, bomb holes, Gabe Larue here, and I had a quick question for Sean. Sean, I was thinking back to the 2012 X Games and the pants that you decided to wear, <laughs> and uh, wondered if you could explain to the community a little bit about your thought process wearing these pants and uh, possibly some technical difficulties you might have had during the first practice with these pants. Oh, my God. I also God. wondered the solution that you and Bud Keen came up with <laughs> to these problems. Oh, my God. Miss you guys. Can't wait to hear the episode. Talk soon. Yeah, Gabe. Yeah, Gabe. Love that guy. Um, oh, man, the saga of these pants, dude. So we had launched a women's line um, with Burton, and, but we didn't have any like women to support the line. You know, they were all wearing different things. And so I was like, I'll rock them. You know what I mean? We had this like kind of leopard zebra print kind of pattern pants. And I was like, oh, these are, these are pretty rock and roll. And I remember I was in my very sort of rock and roll phase with my hair and all that. And, um, and I had him send me like the, first sample or production they made, I got the pair and they were just way too tight, which is saying something. Cause I rocked some really tight pants. Like people at the top of the pipe were like, have you seen the new chick? <laughs> She's crushing it. Have you seen the women's? They're like, dude, that's Sean. <laughs> like, you know? And so I got there and I fully like, I did, I don't know what it was like a front double something and just split my pants and we had to leave practice. And I told Bud, I was like, what are we going to do? I really want to wear these, but you know, uh, I split them open. He's like, I got you. We went to a tailor in town and she had sewn a piece of fabric in the inseam of the pants so that I could still wear them a little more breathing room, we should say. And, um, and Bud took a Sharpie and I didn't know he was such an artist. He drew in the rest of the pattern and little did I know that I was going to like 
bust this run and get a perfect score. So now this like these pants in that moment will live on like forever as perfect hundred at X games and in these, these pants. But yeah, that's, that's what happened. Um, <laughs> my wife still know. wears those pants. Does she? Mm-hmm. There you go. It yeah. worked. Yeah. Yeah. They were so With tight, respect. You, could, you couldn't grab. Oh t- yeah. Barely, <laughs> barely. I was just like, <sighs> Full blow seam. Yeah. Oh my That's god. Amazing. So we. Gotta- I think my mindset though was like, I was kind of double downing. I was like, if I wear these and don't win, I'm gonna look like an idiot. Mm. So I have to win. Was kind of my mindset. <laughs> it's like, if you see a guy on stage in these pants, you're gonna be like, "That's dope." But if you see him, you know, in the subway, you're like, mm, "I don't know what that." hundred <laughs> so, percent. It's like you gotta own it. <laughs> when you yeah. grab a certain wild kit, if you're running an all white kit or you're running a of uh, whatever it is, like, you better show up and fuck shit up because you're you got to be feeling yourself to mm-hmm. wear something like that. You yeah, know what I mean? yeah, I like absolutely. That. You got to do it. Seems you always have too. <laughs> we got a question from John, our, one of our Patreon members, mm-hmm. and he asked Sean, "Do you think your perfect score run should be a, a perfect score?" Because it's kind of debatable to provide some awesome context question. of whether or not we should have perfect scores yeah. in snowboarding. Mm-hmm. Totally. Um, it's a great question. I think this was like a huge reason why I was so thrilled to not be a judge. Cause I, you know what I mean? Like how do you sit at the bottom and just like throw scores at these runs? They're all so amazing. And remembering what happened compared to the, the most recent run. Um, I, I was proud of that run just because I had done something that had never been done before. And I felt rewarded for that. Um, I remember getting a lot of backlash after that because I got a perfect score and people, I'm like, well, I didn't give me the score. I mean, I just did the run. <laughs> they hooked it up. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah. Like I don't, I didn't want it. You know, I was proud to accept and I would do it again. I think I did it again, actually, um, <laughs> for de- more, more debate. Um, and that was at the qualifier snow mass for the, um, Korea Olympics. Um, but, um, yeah, I mean, I was the last rider to go. And I think to cap progression before the last rider, that's absurd. But to be rewarded with the perfect score for doing something that no one had ever done before in the tightest pants imaginable was pretty, pretty sweet, you Mm -hmm. know? Um, And the way it was explained to me was like, well, look, like we should have actually given you 110 because your run was that much better than the previous run, but it capped at, you know, so if you look at it from a pure number standpoint, the way they got to a hundred was they're like, well, look, like this was this much better than the last run you did. And this is what we scored you for it. So that's Mm -hmm. where we had to go with it. And that's why it happened. And we were like, let's make history. This is the first time we've ever done this. And, and you made history by doing back to back 12s, which is something still, being done in the half pipe. So, um, so yeah, I don't know. I, I, I think it's okay in those parameters, you know what I mean? But, but if, it, if, if somebody was still to go and I'd gotten a hundred and there's no chance for that person to win, I think that would be messed up for sure. Way to clear that up. Yeah. Now, you mentioned the back to back 12s. I want to talk about the double Mickey 12. Cause I think a lot of snowboarders could relate to this. They're, they're like, all right, gun to my head. You got to do a front, you know, front 10 double like that. I think could go potentially. Right. Mm. But the Mm -hmm. double Mickey 12, Mm -mm. I think, you know, just get the ambulance ready. Get the (laughs) helicopter parked at the bottom. Cause everybody, I'm going home in a fucking body bag. I can tell you that right now. Cause it's so blind Mm. and the way you do it particularly is so flipped. Mm -hmm. I mean, I would love to to hear from, from a snowboard nerd perspective, like kind of, your approach and how you got yourself over the hurdle to wing that one. Yeah. Well, so I was trying the double mic twist 1080 into the foam pit and I, and I chipped a bone in my ankle, which ended the entire session. I had to go home and, and, and have it looked at. Um, and then it wasn't till later in New Zealand. I actually attempted it for the first try. I, I threw the double mic twist 1080. I kind of landed it and I did one more, I landed it and then I didn't touch it again. I was like, this is really scary. Cause my face is like at the wall. Um, and then it wasn't until after I lost the Olympic qualifier at mammoth to Danny Davis that I was like, Oh my God, I need this trick now. I wasn't planning on doing it. Oh my goodness. I need this trick. So uh, probably two or three days later I was at park city 
getting ready and pretty cloudy, crummy day, but we had a snowmobile. I was with Danny Davis, Kevin Pierce, Mace, all the kids, everybody was there. And I remember I threw one and it was terrifying. And then, um, I was like, something in me is telling me that like, I can't have my face coming at the wall. Um, goodness. I think Kevin may have been in a coma at this point. If I have to go back and think about it. Cause I was really, really scared. Cause I remember my head was like going at the wall and I was like, Oh, this isn't, that's kind of, that's what it was. My head was like right there and I kept hitting my face on the lip of the pipe. And I was so, you know what I mean? We're, we're, we're race car drivers. And when you crash and you see somebody crash, it was, it's, it's, it's like, Oh yeah, that happens. Oh my God. Cause it's the last thing you want to think about. And so that was kind of in my mind, but I knew I needed this trick. And so I'm like, this is a crazier trick and a, a different thought, but what if I just take it to 12? At least my back would be toward the wall. I could see the landing. Like let's, let's maybe just like rip on it and see what happens. And it was kind of like a, you know, the perfect shot, the perfect moment. I remember flying through the air and I'm like, this just feels so right. And it just landed itself like a McTwist. It felt just like that same sort of like end over end sort of landing. And I, I do my McTwist like I do them in skateboarding. Cause when you're in skateboarding, you can't really go down the wall. You got to go straight up and down. So a lot of that's carried over. And so when I do my McTwist, it's a little more inverted and that just threw me into the spin and I nailed it. And I just felt this rush of like, Oh my God, I felt, I, I, I think mm. I just did something really special. Um, you know, and it was, it was intense to see, you know, the reaction of my competitors cause they were all standing there and I don't know, it was just like this, this special moment in time. And I felt like, yeah, my hands were just shaking. And, and Bud mentioned, this is what separates you from, you know, the, the truly great greats from a lot of just greats hmm. is that you did that trick. And then he said, you tried 12 more and probably landed maybe eight of them, hmm. which is uncommon. A lot of times when an NBD gets thrown, you do it once, <laughs> you put it to bed, you yeah, get away with it. murder and you keep going. Yeah. And I think that just little note is an ode to your true competitive, like greatness. That, yeah. You know, well, I just hate getting stuck in a rut. You know what I mean? Like, even if I would do a competition and fall on my run, I'd run back up while they're trying to do the award ceremony and go land the trick that I just fell on. Cause I don't want that to get stuck in my mind. And, mm -hmm. and so like, I always thought that was really strange of other people. And maybe that's just strange of me. I'm hearing now, but like, I'm like, you just figured you just cracked the code on this. Why not just, you know, do it a zillion times so that you don't have to do this scary thing again. Like you've, you've, gotten used to it now you're dancing with you you know you're playing with fire and you're not getting burned and, you, and now all of a sudden it's you, you can put the fire out because you just you, you you're confident now so i think that was maybe just a, a mindset going in of like okay whew, i just did it now let's cement it in you know what i mean like i've cracked i've cracked this sort of like thing in my mind of how the twists and turns and everything happens let's just like muscle memory it now mm. yeah amazing well we're gonna get into a segment of the show here we always do it, you know what it's called, Silk? I think it's a uh, name that video part. Whoa. Mm. Do you mind if I hit the restroom? We could play the sound over again. <laughs> All right, winter is here. In some places, it's on its way. And the stage is set across more than 50 of the best destinations around. It's time to grab your Icon Pass and drop in on the good stuff that awaits. December 14th is your last chance to buy an Icon Pass before they go off sale for the season. They got 10 countries, almost as many languages, and endless ways to play. Now is the moment to pull out the map and start planning for the good stuff you'll score at bombhole beloved destinations like Mammoth, Steamboat, Big Sky, Snowbird, and many others. Of course, home mountain missions are never to be shunned because days with the crew and some well-known turns are what make the season fun. In fact, Icon Pass has an option for every rider in your crew. They got options starting from $319 adult. The Icon Session Pass provides two, three, or four days of access to select destinations. Or for the more frequent rider, the Icon Pass unlocks the most access with no blackout dates to all 50 plus destinations. Once you've got your pass, you're automatically a member of a mountain-minded community who receive access to streaming entertainment from Outside Plus and Paramount Plus, exclusive offers from brands like Smith, 
discounts on lift tickets for friends and family, not to mention discounts on food, beverage, and retail purchases. Yep, it's all good, and it's waiting for you. But remember, December 14th is your last chance to buy an Icon Pass before they go off sale for the season. Claim your pass. The good stuff is coming at IconPass.com before it's too late. All right, Sean, we're going to get into name that video part. Oof. This is uh, this is like for the real core lords here. Hmm. Let's let's see how you do. <laughs> God, is that Peter Line? No, but close sounding band. You know, <sighs> I got to say that's your own video part in Pulse. No way. And the fact that <laughs> You're in you're in amazing company because the only person that ever hasn't got their own part is Jamie Anderson. I was just gonna say so that. You, oh wow! You, you're in you're in an, you guys are have an elite category of your own. Oh wow! And so uh, whoops. Yeah, you're good for per- participating. That looks really nice. Watch the wig. No, you're good. Uh, you got uh, name that video part prize pack from Yeti. Ooh. You got uh, all kinds of bomb hole merch. And, Let's uh, go. Yeah, you know you can catch Sean running his bomb hole merch from here on out on a daily basis. Oh yeah. Um, okay, in part two of Name That Video Parts for our listeners, if you know the song in the video, comment on the photo of Sean on our Instagram when his episode comes out. Here we go. I'm going to tank on these. Well, this My memory's so this bad. One you, oh, it's you for you? Oh, oh amazing. Thank yeah. goodness. Yeah. Yep. yeah, your brother was like, he's going to be shaking his boots because <laughs> he's not going to know. I'm <laughs> sure. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you guys for playing Name That Video Part. <laughs> All right, I want to jump into a great video, and it's called White Album. Great soundtrack, by the way. Thank you. Thank you. And and I noticed in that video, you hit some street rails. Mm. Your front two in onto the steel. He's hitting big old kink rails and board, and slide, board slides and going through fences and all kinds mm-hmm. of cool stuff. I was thinking 2025 rebrand. Mm. You just you just go full street. You're full just street. street. You, just, you just go street guy. It's the only. It's kind of the last uncharted territory for Sean. You know, <laughs> just full rebrand. What do you think, Jones? I mean, yeah. Thanks. Thanks for throwing that to me. I feel like I'm best suited to answer this. To be honest. <laughs> Because those fa- that phase was actually like we were doing video parts in yeah. the tour vans in Japan, and and Sean was like, "Dude, I want to get in the streets," and that's how that those sessions kind of happened. Mm-hmm. We went to Ogden, um, some with JP, some with Downing, some mm-hmm. with all three of us, and mm-hmm. it was cool, like just to sh- see Sean in the streets, and just like in the contest, like that stuff went down first try mm-hmm. for the most part. Mm-hmm. I was I was confident with my rails. I think for me in the video, I was kind of being stuck in this half pipe mold. And I was like, no, I do slope too. And I was doing rail events. And I was like, I really want to like, but I'd never done like urban sort of like, you know, rail riding. And I remember we did some sessions and then one of my fondest memories was actually hitting the rail garden with Jeff Anderson. Mm. I called him up. I'm like, dude, I don't like, I know the park situation, but like, give me a little crash course on this. And you know, um, it was one of my favorite moments that I, I remember cause he, he passed shortly after, but it was, it was so fun to like get walked through, you know, how to approach the rails, different things. And then, and then I just like took to it. And, and, um, obviously the end of the white album was more me hitting, you know, parks set up giant gaps to rails. So I was just trying to do things that I didn't see very often, like big, Hey, I'm going to hit this box off the end of the half pipe over a gap onto another box. And then like giant gap to like a round rail, stuff like that. Um, but, um, it was so much fun to take on that side of snowboarding and go like, you know, out of school and out of place. And there's such funny footage because most of the people there, knew my name and there's like there's no way sean white would be here at a park trying to hit this <laughs> red you know I mean? and i'm like no dude it's me i'm trying to get <laughs> trying to get my cred in the sport you know because at the time too you know being in a being in a, a film was like a big deal and i know you know people had their own movie parts but this was me taking on my own film mm-hmm. um and i was so hyped on uh, Subject Hawkinson in those films that, you know, watching those religiously. And I partnered up with Dave Sione to do that project. And um, <laughs> dude, another legend. I, I, 
I think he still has our family van. Sorry, that's a fun, fun <laughs> fact. That is a but fun fact. we insane. we had this family van. No one wanted us to park it in our community anymore, and they were like slashing the tires and stuff. And so they're like, "Get this thing out of here!" And so we, we gave it to Dave. I don't know if he still has it or not, but that's where the the, fam- the big white family van went. Um, you know, and he became you know like one of our family members through the process. But he really did a great job of capturing like what was going on in my life at that time. Mm-hmm. So like I was trying to prove myself as a rail rider. I was trying to earn respect as a professional skateboarder. I was trying to show my abilities in the half pipe. And I don't know if you remember, but through the video, there's a scene where I actually go in for knee surgery because that's when I had, I was 17. I hurt my knee at the um, at the X games. And so, and at this point I'm panicked. I'm like, you know, I'm a pretty proud guy. And I, I, was, I was taking money from sponsors that were helping me, you know, fund the project and all this stuff. I was like, Oh, I'm about to cut a check to all these people. Cause I'm, you know, I can't deliver. That was gonna, we were going to call it and, and not do the film anymore. Um, and Dave's like, let's just work it in there. Let's just put it into the film in a way that just shows this moment in time. And, and that was one of the most stressful sort of scary things that had happened to me in my career, in my life at that time. Um, cause I'd never been injured before. I thought I was invincible. And then, um, <clears throat> and that, that, that soundtrack, I mean, people, th- I don't know. I still don't know how we got that soundtrack. I mean, it, it should have cost an arm and a leg and it didn't, I don't know what magic he worked or the team behind him, but they scored that incredible soundtrack for, you know, a, a pretty, a pretty reasonable expense, I think. Um, and now when you go into certain coffee shops, like I'll hear one song after another, I'm like, that's too random to be just coincidence. They're playing the white album soundtrack. And so, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm really proud of that, that film. And, um, and I talked to certain writers like Ayumu Arano, you know, I think he mentions it in the doc a bit because, you know, we, we featured him, um, but he's like, dude, I'd run home from school and watch that video. Like that was, you know, I just love that that had that kind of like cult classic effect uh, on people. Mm. Yeah. So cool. You know, I was also thinking as you were talking earlier, you're like, you know, I can't ride at public half pipes. Everybody wants to stop and talk to you. And even us civilians, mm. you know, if, if I say, hey, I'm a snowboarder, the first question ever asked, you know Sean White? Really? Yeah, that guy's, I, <laughs> yeah. I, mean, I guess it's me, so I don't that? know. Yeah. No. <laughs> yeah, that, that's yeah. the first. Anybody, oh, wow. right? Would you say, Jones? Yeah, no, I do. I mean, I do a bit of speaking, you know, yeah. to corporate and schools and stuff. And I've had that quas- question prior. Mm-hmm. And I'll, I'll actually throw that in every once in a while. And I'll pull your, your name up on my phone. <laughs> no. <laughs> and I'm all, not only do I know him. Yeah. I got him in my phone <laughs> and like go. the place will go ape. It's insane. <laughs> oh, so I love like, that. yeah, it's, uh, I love that. it's dope. No yeah. way. I, I think there's something cool there too. You know, talking about, it's, it's funny you say, sorry, it's you something popped in my head, but the only time I've heard that is they tell that to parents at the hospital when they find out their kids have congenital heart defects. Cause I was born with a uh, tetralogy flow, a heart defect. I had to have a couple surgeries. And so that's the only time I've, heard me thrown out in that way. They're like, well, look at this miracle case. He, Dude. he, he became an athlete. He's, you know, and so literally those saving are the, lives. Yeah, well, those are the, you know, like, cause at that moment you're, you're processing this sort of like, you know, unspeakable, you know, horrific thing that's happening to you and your family. And then you kind of get this shimmer of hope, like, well, maybe we could be the rarity in this group and have someone that, 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 you know, lives a normal life or an exceptional life. And so that's the only time I've, I've heard it thrown around, but just in the casual, like this is pretty, it's pretty interesting to hear. All right. It's time to talk snacks and I'm going to talk to you guys about hippies. They are chips that are made with chickpeas and it is alarming how many bags of these chips we put down at the office. They are delicious. I personally love the nacho vibes. They don't taste like health food because they actually taste good but they're actually healthy for you because they're non-GMO. They're made with chickpeas and you can find them at your local grocery store or at hippies.com. I always see them at Whole Foods when I'm in there, so you can find them. They're out there. And be sure to use promo code BOMBHOLE for 20% off at hippies.com. Again, promo code BOMBHOLE, 20% off, hippies.com and support the companies that support snowboarding if you're looking for a healthy snack. 
All right, we're going to take a break and talk about Element. Now, please give a warm welcome to the new Element Chocolate Medley, a tasty trio of flavors featuring chocolate mint, chocolate chai, and chocolate raspberries. Designed to be enjoyed hot or swirled into your favorite recipes. Winter hydration matters too. We become less thirsty both in the cold weather and high elevations, but that doesn't mean we're hydrated. Optimal hydration requires right fluid to electrolyte balance to keep us feeling and performing our best. Go to drinkelement.com slash bombhole for free gift with purchase. Again, drink letter lmnt.com slash bombhole and you'll get a free gift with purchase. Everybody listening to this podcast is going to be like, yep, that's exactly what happened. So it's it's cool. It's cool to have you here and talk mm-hmm. about that. And I have a bit of a blanket question yeah. that I, you know, when, when we have great, you know, people that have done such great things like yourself in this, in the chair, I, I always want to know, like, you know, what do you think separates, and I'm sure you've been asked this a million times on mm-hmm. major platforms. What do you really think separates the, the truly great from the good? Mm. I think it's I think it's looking for the lo- the road kind of less traveled honestly it's it's finding those moments to be different and stand out and then kind of walking that path walking the line like doing it you know what I mean there's plenty of situations where you know I pulled up to the course and I wasn't the best but I found a way to make it work in my advantage or just to dig deep or like just the mindset you know like showing up in Japan and hearing everybody hates the jump, you're like, oh, well, if I can just find a way to like it a little bit, I'm already in a place that's a you know greater success rate than others. And and so you know if the weather's terrible and everybody's just bumming and not like, oh, how can I make this fun? How can I turn it around, make it something positive? I think there's a great example of this where I kind of took a different path. There was an X Games where they had this giant kind of um, gap built in between the two jumps and the biggest name in the sport like Travis Rice tried to jump it and he didn't make it and so everybody's like the word was steer clear of that because Travis tried it couldn't do it no one's touching it and for me I was kind of outgunned at that that event because I didn't really have the big spins and tricks to win. So I was like, I think that if nobody's touching that feature and I just do something on it, it's going to set me apart from everyone else. And I ended up winning that year um, because I was different. I, d- I, I chose a different path or I did something that was kind of considered risky or scary. And I kind of like saw my way through it, you know? Um, and then like embracing the differences, you know, like, I felt like at times, you know, I idolized, you know, like Muhammad Ali, like he had the gift of gab. He just had a way about him and he would win his fights in a, in a almost like, you know, there's a famous photo where he goes to punch the other boxer that's falling down and he just waits. He pulls the punch to just watch this guy fall. You know, it's like these classic moments like, whoa, he's really, you know, or, 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 um, you know, Andre Agassi had the hair, he had the, the rebel attitude, he had this thing, you know, there's something about them that set them apart from everyone else. And, you know, I naturally kind of had red hair and I just leaned into it and then this and then that, and I just kind of found my own path through it. So I would say it's, it's, it's just finding your way, your, you know, if you're in music, it's like finding your sound. It's a very special thing to find and it's very rare. Um, but when you do, it's, it, it, you know, special things can happen. And so for me, I feel like in the sport, I was able to find my sound. But when I look at other athletes, it's those defining moments where like something went terribly wrong in their life and then they kind of came back and did something great. Um, it's those defining moments that we all love about sports, you know, docs or anything like that. It's like you were faced with this thing and majority of people would have gone the other way, but you went this direction. And, and that's something that I learned a lot, um, in my later years of like, you know, we, we really grow as people from the, the, the hard times when everything's good, it's good. You're going, but when you're, you're challenged and you're in a position of like, gosh, my, my world feels like it's collapsing in on me. And, 
and and you kind of face that challenge, you're going to grow as a person. And it's like, which direction are you going to grow in? And, and so a lot of those things for me felt like that's what kind of separated me from the pact maybe uh, at the time <clears throat> and, and maybe still in life. But, um, but yeah, I'm, 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 I'm flattered to be, <laughs> to be considered. And, you know, like when you're talking about other sports greats and to be in that, that sphere of things, like I, I still see myself as the same guy. I have, my, I don't know what you call it, fame dysmorphia or whatever. <laughs> like I, I feel pretty, you know, like I operate on a pretty normal level, um, you know, and, and, and then you turn around and go, oh yeah, that's right. I'm, I have this whole thing attached to my identity. Massive. But yeah, yeah. You know, so. Yeah, no, you're a celebrity. Yeah. It's, it's a different world. I mean, that's it. Yeah. There's snowboard famous and there's like, you're on like you're in a different arena like it's mm. but but I think just thinking about the generations of competitors too you know I I was going through like looking at old footage and it's like you're riding against Ross Powers and David Benedict mm-hmm. and Andy Finch Danny Cass Trevor Andrew and then you know now you got you even through that you got Danny Davis and you got Travis yeah. you know you mentioned Travis Rice and Steve Fisher and mm-hmm. you know KP and now you know Ayumu and 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 it's just like yeah. this you've been you know a lot of people have came and went and you've maintained the top of your game and that's mm. fucking incredible i think you know uh, it's probably a coined phrase by now from me but like i have always said that my greatest accomplishment wasn't necessarily one competition or or an Olympics or something like that. It was like to continuously stay on top of a sport that's kind of ever changing. I mean, you got, you're trying to guess the trend of like where the tricks are going or, or be in the front line of what's happening. It's almost like fashion of like, what's going to be cool in a year from now, where, where am I going to focus my efforts and, and hope that that's the right direction, um, to go in. Um, you know, and, and it's so funny to talk about those names. I mean, man, we, we talked about the past for a second, but, you know, just to see Trevor Andrews journey from Trevor Andrews from Nova Scotia, professional snowboarder for Burton to, you know, I don't know what was first Trizza or trouble, trouble, Trizza, was Trizza, first, yeah. then, then trouble, then the, then the Gucci ghost. And like, you know, it's, it's, it's amazing to see people, you know, lean into things outside of their normal sphere, you know? And, and I always loved that about Trevor and I, was a child like hanging with them and went like, Oh, that's so cool. And like, it's not a, it's not a strange thing that I would like venture into music myself or like want to put on an event or like get into the fashion side of things. Like I was just a product of kind of like what was around me. And that's what was around me. It was like young guys living their dream of snowboarding, getting paid handsomely. And this is the heyday of snowboarding. Like, you know, fuck me. cheddar biscuits, cheddar, cheddar biscuits, cheddar biscuits. Yeah. Cheddar biscuits. Yeah. dude, people were making, bank. I mean, people, people were making a lot of money. It was just, it was just like X games was booming. Like everything was in, it was just like that moment in time. I remember uh, hearing from guys that they were like cutting up Louis Vuitton bags to like wrap their car seats. So they had LV car seats and Mm -hmm. like, dude, it was just a crazy time. (laughs) It was a crazy time. And I remember sitting there kind of like watching all of this and, and for good and bad, you know, I, I watched, um, you know, certain things go down and, and just be like, oof, that's probably not the best decision. Okay. Like I, I have to thank those guys so much for like showing me what to do and what not to do, you know? And it's, it, it, it was hard to be there and see these friends of mine just kind of like fall off or disappear. But through the thick of it, you know, I've kind of lasted so long. I mean, that, that was such a funny thing. I remember showing up at the I want to say it was the Korea Olympics or something. Maybe it was Korea. I, I forget. No, it was Korea. Excuse me. So I show up at the Korea Olympics and I remember one of my competitors was just like there as a coach with his child who looked probably like five or six, like on his shoulders. And I was like, oh my God. And he's like, so what's up? And I, and I was like, well, what's up with you? And he's like, oh yeah, I got the kids. And he's like, so what's up with you? And I'm like, still doing it. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. You're looking at it, bud. <laughs> like, you know, like Olympic uniform. it's great. Yeah. Here we go. Like n- number four, like what, let's what go. What have you been up to? Uh, the same thing since <laughs> I was five. Yeah. basically. Remember that thing that we did together way back when I'm, st- I'm still doing that. Um, and I'm loving it, you know, but, but yeah, it, it was crazy to see this, like, um, 
see in these crops of new riders, you know, and, and, and it's a funny kind of timeline because as Trevor, Keir, and some of those riders slowly kind of, you know, took on different roles within the sport or, or went into art, fashion, music, um, you know, the new crop of riders were all guys my age. So I'd finally caught up to, you know, my competitors and, and that created like a fun element and also like a really hard sort of thing. Cause I was desperate to belong. And then all of a sudden I'm with guys my age and, and, you know, from the things before I mentioned, like it was hard to just kind of like operate on a friend basis when we're competing every single day on and off the mountain. You know what I mean? We're competing for deals. We're competing for, you know, girls were competing for, you know, everything. Like we're just young guys together, like trying to do our best. And so, um, so yeah, I wish it, I wish it was kind of different at the time, but there was a lot of rivalry that happened, which I didn't really see, you know, personally, I was like, Oh, this is how it's going to be. And then it just kind of like went a different direction. But yeah. Um, but the, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I mean, it was so fun to look back and remember like, Ross Powers just hitting every podium and then like winning the Olympics and just that first backside air, all those things that kind of like drove me and gave me the like, I should win, I gotta win the Olympics. Like, look at what Ross did. Like, oh my God, he's one of my heroes. Like I gotta, you know, there's a lot of things in my life that, that kind of were inspired by that group, you know? Beautifully, beautifully said. All right, we're gonna take a quick break and talk to you guys about pub beer. No matter what you're doing, cracking open a pub beer responsibly, it's always a good choice if you're looking for some cheap fun. Also to be noted, pub beer supports snowboarding, whether it's the magazine or the podcast, they're giving back to snowboarding. So you always want to support those companies that put their money in snowboarding. So if you're looking to responsibly crush some can, so to speak, be sure to check out pub beer. Uh, we have uh, we got we don't have you for a ton of time, so yeah. we got to we got to move through some staples here. Uh, something we do on the show here is called hot takes, and it's mm. kind of as rapid fire as you can be, not necessarily elaborated answers. Hot takes is presented by Oakley. Now Oakley just dropped their team collection outerwear. I saw Stale Sandback's new kit. He's always looking fresh. Of course, Sage Kotzenberg has his kit. He's looking great out there. They got. New innovation in their Mod 3 helmet. This thing is top of the line. So if you're looking for a new helmet, be sure to check out the Mod 3. I also love the Mod 1 Pro. Great helmet. I recently started wearing that in the past couple of years. Thoroughly enjoying it. And as soon as we know the dates for Oakley Community Days, we will be sharing about it. But if you are in the area, be sure to check out Oakley Community Days. I love um, getting long-winded. Yeah, no. <laughs> yeah, this is a rapid I'll fire. I'll try to situation. keep it short. This has been so So this will be interesting. So my dad. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, let me teach you how to skin a cat before okay. I actually answer that. Okay, so first question we like to ask, hard-hitting. Mm. In your opinion, who is the goat of snowboarding, both male and female? Oh, wow. Ah, I'd have to say in my eyes, it would be Terry Hawkinson. Um, I'm assuming I'm in that category. So I feel weird, maybe not mentioning myself, but, um, for women's, I always think of Kelly Clark. I mean, she had not only an amazing career, but a long career. Mm -hmm. And she just stuck it out and she was like the ups and downs and won the Olympics, lost the Olympics, did, you know, she did so much. I would say Kelly. Um, and now obviously the current would be Chloe, you know, she's doing it. And you can just see a difference when she rides. It was like, oh, cool. They did their, I don't even need to see, I can see it from the chair and go, oh, that's, that's Chloe. Okay. I, would you consider snowboarding an art form or a sport? I'd say it's an art form personally okay who has your favorite style Ooh. ever i'd say danny cass fucking great i awesome, mean great answer i don't know how he he would just land flat and just like <laughs> boost the next hit i'm like what is uh, and like the arms wouldn't move there was no pumping in sight i don't know how he was generating speed his Mythbusters need to get in there and like <laughs> tell us what's happening. <laughs> well, he was fueled by uh, 
alcohol and <laughs> grenades. That would be a <laughs> like what? Great you just myth floated buster. down on, fl- on yeah. fumes. Yeah. Okay, rails as in steel or powder? <sighs> powder. Uh, yeah. That's the wrong answer. This I one know, has a sorry, wrong that answer. Sorry, that one's that's, that's okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay, who is your favorite method? <laughs> oh. Mm. That's tough. There's so many. I mean, I kind of want to say Terry again. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Do you have a favorite snowboard video ever made? I would say it was Subject Hawkinson. He makes the pretzel. I mean, come on. Favorite <laughs> uh, <laughs> favorite snowboard graphic? Snowboard graphic. There was a few. I... Who had the coolest one? I'm trying to think. My my mind immediately jumped to Ross Powers is like he had this like fire with this like monster kind of coming out. And it was such a cool one. Um, but I also loved the balance. A lot of Terry stuff here. You can see where my my heart was as a kid. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like he had the balance. And I thought it was so cool that you, when you got the boards together, they made a picture. Mm-hmm. I was like, this is the coolest. You know what I mean? Right. Um, but I loved, I loved that. And that was the first time anybody had kind of had like obscure sort of graphic that wasn't like a, Hey, here's a picture of a skull or here's a picture of this. It's like, okay. Yeah. Uh, two more questions. One, uh, dream sponsor. If you have any sponsor in the world, what would it be? <laughs> like I might pick for example, Home Depot. Oh, <laughs> like a, I feel like you've had it. Damn. Yeah. <laughs> Target. I've had a few. My, my girlfriend's dream sponsor is Target. I yeah. can tell you that right now. Actually, I, fiance, I should say. Sorry. Yeah. I would. I would have to say, and it's so insane that you said that because I would have to say Home Depot. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I, I have texts asking my agent like, "Can I get on the Depot program?" <laughs> They're like, "I'm like Depot, I'd do it for free." Like, I, I don't know. Maybe it was COVID that I got figured out how handy I was. But did I just love going? There? It's an ongoing joke where I just send pictures from the from the wood aisle or whatever. It's like, so good. Um, but um, I think b- one of the best sponsors I had had to, had to have been Red Bull. Dude, it was like joining the mafia. These guys were everywhere. They were so well connected. They had tons of cash to throw around and it didn't matter where you were in the world. I'm in the Grand Cayman Islands and they pull up with like, you know, the wings team girls and the, and the, remember when those mini coops were driving around with Red Bull cans on them, mm-hmm. they pull up with them. Some guy jumps out. He's, he's got a fresh can of ice with the, like you, you could just go anywhere and do anything with them. And no idea was too out there. And I remember, I mean, you could ask any, anybody that rode for them in, in the heyday of, of Red Bull, but you know, just absurd. I, yeah. They were just like doing the most absurd things. I remember my birthday dinner, the receipt literally rolled down, hit the floor and kept rolling. And they were like, yeah, just put it on the budget. <laughs> crazy, crazy time. They know how to burn some budge. That's yeah, for sure. That's yeah. rad. Okay, last question. Worst trend. Worst trend. What do you got? Mm. Like within the sport? Yeah, we used, I mean, you can do human nature too, <sighs> but yeah. within, oh. you know, whatever. I mean, within the sport, I, I didn't understand the no high back thing. Was there a purpose for that? Or was it just that we don't need them? It's a useless technology. Let's get rid of it. Or was it more of a style thing? I'll, can I answer? Yeah, take it, take it. S- would be a style. Yeah. W- with any interest I ever had. JG, however, will argue uh-huh. um, that it's effective and it has oh. a purpose. So okay, not for a backsider. Not. I mean, don't be railing no. in like seventy miles an hour at your backside wall, going like, <laughs> "Where's that Ford lean? <laughs> like, where's that?" Yeah, but I think he would agree if you're going, you know, mock a million in a 22 foot pipe. Yeah. You're on high backs. Damn. All okay. right. We got a guest question from your broski here. Who? My brother? Yep. Oh, wow. Jesse White, who's awesome, by the way. Great guy. He's the guy. He's, he's the, the man. He's the good guy. Okay. He's, he's a, a good guy. guy. Hey, Sean. What up? It's your brother, Jesse. Uh, hope you guys are having a blast. Excited to hear this one. Uh, I've been asked to give you a guest question, so 
you know, I was thinking about our early days growing up and riding, and I just want to hear, you know, how those days were for you. Like, what were those memories like, and 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 really, how much impact do you think they had on like your snowboarding and kind of your career, and and um, just generally like looking back, what that kind of meant to you. Mm. Thanks a lot, and uh, I hope you guys uh, came to hear your answer. Talk soon. <laughs> He's so funny, man. Um, I would say my early days were Snow Summit. You know, it was like riding the park at Snow Summit they basically were like snowboarders. You just stay over there. We'll give you the whole West Ridge of the mountain, but just like stay over there. Um, and it was a party mountain. So people would get pretty intoxicated and then like come hit the park. And they're just like, you know, people from LA, they're like, let's go. And then you know I mean? they just show up and, and come ride. So like my early years were, I think I learned to turn by like, getting a, I would have to get around like three people that had crashed on the way to the jump. And then the, then the four people like with their discarded stuff in the landings every time. Um, but it was the best. I remember just lapping that high speed chair and I was following my brother through the park and we kind of tiered the, the train of riders with, you know, whoever was the best in the front to maybe the least talented rider in the back so that if someone fell, you're not going to run into them. Um, and I remember just following them and not thinking it was the best. Cause like, if you're going the same speed as somebody that's already clear to jump and you're just behind them, you're going to make it, you know, you don't have to guess, you don't have to eyeball it. You're just following the leader and you go through. And I remember hitting these massive jumps and these things. And it really affected my riding at the time. Cause I'm riding with these guys that are way older than me. And then I'd go bump down into the like, age bracket that I was in and I could do stuff that the kids couldn't because I was just riding with people better than me. Um, and I've done a lot of thought on just the environment at the time because, um, you know, Snow Summit, uh, Chris Gunnerson, amazing. Yeah, let's give it up. Uh, amazing park builder designer. I mean, he got his start, I want to say at Snow Summit and he was just building these things, these courses, these rails, these jumps, all this stuff that you know, was the perfect training ground to breed someone like myself. Um, within one run, I could hit a whole run of rails, a whole entire half pipe run, and then a series of jumps all the way down to the, to the chairlift every single run. So I was practicing every sort of avenue of, except powder backcountry kind of stuff. I was hitting most obstacles in the, in the sport. And, and so, um, you know, it was just like an amazing time. It was just like an amazing just so happened to be in the right place, the right time when that was all going on. Cause a, a lot of people still think I'm from Vermont where they had a school, an academy for snowboarding or from Colorado or something I'm like, no, I grew up at the beach. <laughs> like, <laughs> just like I'd hit it on the weekends. Um, and you know, that's just kind of how we operated. But I think I carry a lot of that. You know, he, he asked wh who, who I am today because of that. I think a lot of my sort of, traits I still have from when I was a kid. So like I burn out if I'm in the mountains too long. So like just show up, I get after it and I get out. I don't want to mess around for like a whole month, just sitting there like waiting for it. I would, I would show up I'm like, we got three days and I'd, I'd have to get it done. And then I'd leave. And so at times where I had actually too much time on my hands, I would just procrastinate and kind of like lose focus. And a lot of the riders at the time were better than me, way better than me as kids um, because they lived in the mountains but they all majority of all of them burnt out and got over snowboarding because it was just every day, the same thing. And they wanted to do other things where I was the opposite. I always wanted to snowboard cause I didn't get it as much and didn't have access to it like they did. And my parents, I don't know whether they thought to do this or it was just a coincidence, but we, I've never lived in the mountains my entire career as a pro snowboarder. And maybe that's some of the things, you know, some of the, weird things about being core and being whatnot. Like it just, you know, I just had a different upbringing. You know, I, I wasn't, I wasn't born and, and lived in the mountains. I just like, I, I was a visitor and then I'd go home and then come back and just froth and just like have my two days to get after it and go home. So, but yeah, the best of times. Mm -hmm. And thank you, Chris, for building that park, man. You set me on a, 
on a path. <laughs> Amazing. We had a guest question from Gunny. We didn't yeah. we didn't get to because we're we're over time right now. It yeah, looks okay. like so we got to start wrapping things up here. Um, and uh, I just want to say thanks so much for coming on and clearing. Like I just think there was a little bit of like people misunderstand you, man. And and it's really special to have have you come on and you're beloved by us and uh, a, you know. Like snowboarding as a whole owes you so much. Mm -hmm. And so I just wanted to say thank you so much for coming and chatting with us. So. No, I appreciate that, man. I mean, honestly, it was very strange for me to come in here because I, I've always been taught to kind of like turn the cheek and just kind of like, and, and I don't feel like I came in here and, you know, I'm not blaming anybody or pointing fingers or something. I was just kind of explaining reasons for why I did certain things. But through the thick of it, I just kind of didn't say anything because you know, if you say something, then the media picks it up and it's a whole thing. And as you know what I mean? And, and so I kind of didn't really have a safe place to talk about it. So I was actually pretty thrilled to come in here and just be like, dude, this is how it was like picture it from this scenario. Like look, look at it from this point of view and, 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 you know, just wrap out about snowboarding. It's so fun. Cool. So, so, so cool to be here. So thank you. Yeah. And then lastly, obviously, uh, the max documentary, incredible, uh, that thing's four part series. Um, yeah. What, what else we got? Any, anything else we should talk about before we throw Dude, a bow on this thing? We got white space. Yeah. We just came out with our, our new line. Uh, we just added women's, um, we've like upped our tech for the kids boards. I was like, I don't want to make like boards for kids. I want to make like, you know, a legit snowboard for someone pursuing snowboarding that's young. You know what I mean? Because we didn't really have that when I was a kid. You know, I rode hard boots for the majority of my early career because they didn't make kids boots or kids bindings. Um, but for me with the brand, like I'm just so thrilled to be like in this creative space with my brother and my buddy who's here, Miles. You know, we, yeah, my, we met, his mom worked the check-in counter of the US Open in Stratton, Vermont. We came in there with my mom. She's like, oh, my, my kids got red hair too. You guys should hang. <laughs> Here it is. <laughs> years and years Beautiful. later, uh, you know, he's helping me build this brand and, and, and find ways to be creative and innovative and like support the community of snowboarding. And um, it's just been a thrill. Like I wake up excited to work on the brand and to be in this kind of driver's position because I want to be able to make products that could potentially shape you know, the future of the sport or the future riders of the sport and, and to just be involved in that position that I was never really in. I mean, I rode for brands my entire life, which was an amazing learning process. Um, how they market, how they manufacture, how they distribute, you know, how the ads viewed what's, what's, what's happening here. And, and to put all that into my own thing has just been incredible. It's been so rewarding. And, and to see people on my products, has just been like, it's just, it's, it's amazing. <laughs> and JJ is, is over too. We got building the team. Um, yeah, I don't know if it'd be like a traditional team where we're, we're, we're lining everybody up. It's just a new, it's just the future. Now everybody's got their Instagrams, so, you know what I mean? But yeah, we got the, we got the crew. We got Toby, JJ. I know, uh, Vito has been, been rocking our gear. Um, you know, a bunch of amazing, talented people and, and, you know, I get it though. Like it's, it's a hard thing to step into this industry because you got these legacy brands that have been around for so long and I'm not going to lie. Like it's expensive. It's expensive to buy boards and to do these things. And so we're making the best product we can, but keeping it in a range where you could still purchase it. But I understand where you go into a shop and you buy a board. A lot of people hold those boards for like 10 plus years. Like people are like, Oh yeah, I still got my board. You know, like it's a big decision to buy a board. Cause you're not just like buying a sweatshirt and I'm like, Oh, I'm going to buy another one next week. It's, it's a big choice. And, and to have somebody ride our product and, you know, believe in us that much and like get the board and like, I'm rocking this for the next few years. Like this is, this is it. And that trust and that sort of connection with the consumer and then like getting the, the, the friends of mine on the program and supporting them. I and mean, JJ was working, um, for the, the U S team and now he's, he's full time with us. So it's just epic. Killer. It's really, really fun. So rad. Yeah, man. Exciting. Well, thank you so much for coming and chatting with us, Sean. We really appreciate everything you've done for snowboarding, man. I just can't say it enough. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Sean. <laughs> and lastly, thanks Cheers. everybody that tunes in. Thank you, Silk. Uh, thank you to all Pleasure. the sponsors. Yeah, Silk. And thank you to everybody in snowboarding. We appreciate you guys.
over right and out on. from the bomb hole. See you on the mountain. <laughs> Damn, dude. Cool. Dude, that's, dude.